Hey, welcome everybody to our Network Security Deep Dive. My name is Kevin Wallace, and I want to give you a huge thank you for, for taking a good chunk of your time today to join us for this deep dive. Here's what's going on. We're recording this in September of 2022, if you're watching this on replay, and this is our eighth anniversary of being in business. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this big massive marathon, and I could think of no better topic than security for our marathon training session. In fact, let me give you an idea right off the bat what's coming up today by taking a look at our agenda. We're going to begin by seeing that network security, whether it's your focus or not in your job, you got to know it. There is a tremendous demand for security in IT right now, and it's unprecedented. It's not like any other skill set. We'll take a look at some stats. Then we'll get into sort of at a high-level overview, we'll get into a look at the three main goals of network security, and we'll see how we can carry out some of those different goals. Then we're going to be getting in to some common network attacks because we want to know what we have to defend against. And we'll talk about how we can put up some defenses. And I should say right off the bat, in this session, we're going to be talking about some tools that malicious users might use to gain access to a network. So let me give a disclaimer right now. I do not support or condone the malicious or illegal use of any of these tools. I want to give you this information to help you defend against those bad actors out there. And because today is going to be such a, a lengthy session, you bet, I'm going to be giving you some breaks throughout. We'll probably have a couple of major breaks uh, during today's session. Just guessing, and this could vary a little bit, this is just a guess, I'm guessing today's session is going to run about five hours. So you might want to uh, think about that and what you have coming up over the next few hours. But uh, coming up in Module 4, we'll get into wireless security. There are all sorts of wireless security standards, and not just wireless in terms of Wi-Fi, but uh, here's, a, here's a Bluetooth. It's called an Ubertooth 1. Here's a Bluetooth adapter. We can actually do some hacking with, uh, with Bluetooth. We'll get into that as well, talk about how we can protect ourselves against that. Then we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about session hijacking. You see, here's the deal. Instead of trying to guess or figure out somebody's password to get logged in to something that they have access to, what if we wait for them to gain access on their own? They log in, they give their credentials, they're talking back and forth. They've got that session established. And then we, well, not we, but a malicious user hijacks that session. That lets them bypass the whole process of being authenticated. We'll talk about how session hijacking can happen and how we can protect against session hijacking. We'll talk about physical security because we can have all these great protocols and systems in place, but if somebody can just walk up and get to the console, well, here's, a, I've got a, got a Cisco Catalyst switch right here that we're gonna be using for a demo later on. If somebody can get access to the console, they can own your device pretty much. They can do password recovery. So we want to have physical security as well. And we'll talk about some of the emerging security th threats that we haven't traditionally thought a lot about, or at least I haven't. And that's with Internet of Things devices and for cloud. How do we protect as we're moving our resources and our data from centralized data centers on premise at our site out to a cloud service provider and we're going to see one way of getting that security to the cloud, and we're using it more and more, is VPN technology, virtual private, net, uh, virtual private networks. We'll talk about different types of uh, protocols that can be used, how we might use some of them together, and I think you'll really enjoy that VPN discussion. And we're going to wrap it up with a discussion of dynamic multipoint VPNs. So lots of great security content coming up today. Hope you're excited. Hope you're going to take a lot of notes. And again, I, I realize this is going to be a marathon session, so we will give you a couple of breaks throughout. And my brief bio, because we're going to be spending a lot of time together, here's where I'm coming from as I approach this topic. My name is Kevin Wallace. I've got a, a couple of CCIEs. I got my first CCIE way back in 2001. It was the Route Switch CCIE, and I've since then upgraded it or updated it to the CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure. I've also got... In 2012, I got a CCIE in voice, and I've since upgraded that to a CCIE in collaboration. And now, being a CCIE for 21 plus years, 
I've reached lifetime emeritus status, so I don't have to retake anything. I get to just keep my CCA for life, and that really makes me happy. But I've been working with Cisco gear really since the very first Cisco router. Back in the late 80s, the Cisco AGS Plus router, that was the first router I worked on. And I've been working with Cisco gear ever since. I've taught courses for Cisco Learning Partners for about 14 years before I went into business for myself about eight years ago and started teaching these courses online. Uh, in the real world, one of my favorite jobs ever, okay, was my favorite job ever in the real world because my family and I were huge Disney fans. You can probably see some little Disney artifacts on the bookshelf behind me. But um, I got to be one of five network designers down at Walt Disney World in Florida. That was just an amazing experience. I got to design the network that tied together the Magic Kingdom and Epcot and the, the studios and Animal Kingdom and a bunch of the resorts. Just had a great time there. And I've written a bunch of books, done a lot of video courses for the folks over at Cisco Press. And I've been privileged to speak at a couple of Cisco Lives. And um, each time I got the Distinguished Speaker Award. Bottom line is... I've been doing this for a while and I am passionate about it. I love this stuff and I cannot wait to add some value to you today because we're going to be touching on security concepts that show up in a bunch of different Cisco and non-Cisco exams. Let's get started here in module one by just getting a sense for the incredible demand we have in the industry for network security skills. I attended Cisco Live earlier this summer out in Las Vegas. Yeah, let's see, it was in June, actually, uh, June of uh, 2022, and uh, got to meet a lot of people after being uh, sort of shut down and doing it virtually for a couple of years. It was great to see people face-to-face. -face. I got to meet a lot of people, and I attended the keynotes, and one of the keynote statements that really stood out to me was this. It was from uh, G2 Patel. He's the executive vice president and general manager of security and collaboration with Cisco, and when he said this, it just jolted me. I thought, wow, that is so true. He said, war starts with cyber before it moves to air and land. Think about that. When there is war between countries, instead of launching some sort of offensive strike with missiles or something, no, the first attack is probably going to be cyber, a cyber attack. So we want to protect ourselves against those kinds of attacks. It is so, so critical. In fact, we see that reflected in this year's list of the 15 most in-demand certifications. This is from CIO Magazine. And one of the big security certifications out there is CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker Certification. I'd like you to notice that it shows up as number five on this list. It actually beats out the Cisco CCNP and Cisco CCIE. Uh, they're on the list as well in the top 10, but uh, certified ethical hacking beats out these top tier Cisco certifications for certs that are in demand in 2022. And uh, back in, uh, at the end of June this year, Fortune Magazine had this article that I was reading and uh, I love the headline. It says, companies are desperate for cybersecurity workers. Currently, there are more than 700,000 jobs right now that need to be filled. And if you're watching this in replay a month or two down the road, it might be even more than that. But the forecast is throughout the rest of this decade, every year, we're not going to make up that shortfall. There's going to continue to be this lack of cybersecurity professionals. So this is something that we need to know, whether we want to go into that as our primary focus in our IT careers or I'm kind of a collaboration person uh, myself. I love collaboration. I love re regular enterprise technologies. But in all that, there's security. No matter what your focus is, you've got to know about security. I've never, I've been doing this for what? Over 30 years? Yeah, 33 or so years right now. And I've never seen a demand in the industry like we have a demand for security professionals today. So this is going to be critical stuff to know. And hopefully I've, I've sold you on the fact that this is super important to your career, whether you're going to focus on security or not. You still need to have a, a, a base knowledge of it so you can be conversant with other people in the industry. But let's get in to the three big goals of security. What, when I say we're securing a network, what exactly does that mean? What targets do we have? Well, first up, I'm talking about confidentiality. I don't want somebody to read my email. 
I don't want somebody to be able to get on my server and look at my files. I don't want them to print to my printer. If they capture traffic going across the wire or going across the airwaves over an antenna, I don't want them to be able to read it. I want to have confidential communication and confidential storage. We also want to make sure that our data has not been modified. We want to check the integrity of that data. And one of the things we have to defend against is somebody just bringing our system down. You've no doubt heard about uh, DOS or DDoS, uh, denial of service attacks. That's where an attacker just floods a system with so much traffic that system is not able to do its regular job because it's dealing with that onslaught of junk data coming into it. And that can bring our system down. We're being denied service to our system. In other words, we want our systems to be available. And we're going to talk about what metric defines high availability. First, though, let's focus on confidentiality. One way we can have confidentiality is through a variety of security appliances that we can use in our network. We'll be talking about those here in just a moment. But in addition to that, on our Cisco routers, as an example, we can use ACLs, access control lists. And I'm going to be showing you the syntax, and I'm going to be uh, challenging you with uh, some troubleshooting scenarios with ACLs coming up here in a moment. And also, we're going to encrypt our traffic. When I say encrypt traffic, we're going to take our data string, and we're going to scramble it up. And as part of that scrambling up, we're using a mathematical algorithm, and that algorithm is probably going to use something called a key. Might be 128 bits in length, might be 109, it could be varying number of bits. But this key is something that's going to be maybe secret, depending on how we do it. And if I use a key and you use a key and we use the same key to encrypt and to decrypt our data, if somebody captures it in the middle and they don't have that key, they're not going to be able to read our data. We'll talk about some different encryption options. But let's get started by taking a look at some different security appliances. One that you've probably heard a lot about is the concept of a firewall. Now, a firewall is generally going to stand guard at the perimeter of your network as you go out to the internet or you go out to a wide area network. Or, or maybe you go to just a different a different area of your own network with a different security level. But a firewall is basically a set of rules to say what traffic is permitted to come in, what traffic is permitted to go out. And let's talk about some different types of firewalls. One type is maybe running on your operating system on your desktop or laptop computer right now. If you're running Microsoft Windows or Mac OS or Linux, or just about any operating system, there's probably an option for you to use a software-based or a host-based firewall. So if somebody's trying to get to your computer specifically, you can set up some firewall rules to allow or deny that kind of activity. Now that's on sort of the micro level, getting down to the individual devices, but oftentimes we think of firewalls as being an appliance that's going to sit at the boundary of our network. And a very rudimentary type of firewall, and I even hesitate to call this one a firewall, but I want you to know it because it might show up on an exam someday, is a packet filtering firewall. When I say packet filtering firewall, I'm talking about an access control list, really. A set of rules to say this section of the network or this IP address or these IP addresses, they're allowed to go out or they're not allowed to go out or they're not allowed to come in. For example, this would not be a good use of a packet filtering firewall. Let's say that we set up a router at the edge of our network going out to the internet. And we thought, well, I trust people inside of my network. I'm going to allow them to come into my router and go out to the internet. But I don't trust the internet because there's a lot of bad actors out there. So we set up our access control list to block traffic on the internet from coming into us. Think about how that would work though, or how that would not work. Let's say you're on the inside, you're a trusted individual, and you're trying to go to a website on the internet. Well. As that packet goes into the router, it says, oh, they're good people. They're on the inside of the network. Let them go out to the internet and you go to the internet website. The internet website is trying to send you the page that you requested back. But when that page comes back into the router, the router says, no, 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 you're coming from the internet. I don't trust you. And it's going to drop that. You see, we're not getting two-way communication. So sitting at the boundary of our network, that's not a good place to use a packet filtering firewall. What we might do instead is use a stateful firewall. Now here, we're overcoming that issue that I just described. 
we remember the state of a session. Again, I'm on the inside, I'm trying to get to a device out on the internet somewhere, and when I go into the router or into this stateful firewall, it's gonna make a note of this. It's gonna say, oh, I see this IP address on the inside of the network is going to this other IP address on the outside of the network. They're using this source and this destination port number. I'm gonna remember that. Then, when that web server, in this example, returns that web page, the source and destination IP addresses and the source and destination port numbers, they're going to be transposed, but the router is going to realize that and say, oh, that's return traffic from a session that, here's the key, a session that originated on the inside of the network. So I'm going to allow that traffic back in. That's a stateful firewall, and that's what we used really for decades. But in recent years, that's been uh, improved even more. Now you might hear about a next generation firewall or a layer seven firewall. Here, the firewall appliance can examine more than just IP address information. It can get into, as the name suggests, it can get into layer seven information. It can understand how different protocols work together. For example, here's the first one that comes to mind. I do a lot in collaboration and when I'm setting up an IP phone call with a Cisco IP phone, I might be using a protocol called SIP, the session initiation protocol, to set up the session to make the phone call. But then once I start talking, that SIP session is going to uh, is going to let me start stream streaming my voice and that's going to be done using the RTP protocol, the real time transport protocol. Well, a stateful firewall is just the the first example that comes to mind is going to understand that, oh yeah, if a session begins using SIP, then it might transition to RTP. And it's going to realize, okay, that's still part of the same session. So we can look into protocol-specific things in our streams and permit or deny traffic based on that. Something else we might want to do, and this is what we did at a university where I used to work uh, years ago, we can divide the network into different security zones. What we had at the university was we had a connection out to the internet, and one firewall port pointed out to the internet. We had another section of the university that contained the, uh, the residence halls where the students lived. And we had another section that contained the faculty and the staff, the classrooms. We wanted to prevent somebody from sitting in their dorm room at night from getting into maybe a faculty computer. We wanted to put that in a different security zone. So what we did, is we created what uh, some people call a DMZ or a demilitarized zone. We had one firewall port going out to the internet. We had another firewall port going into the faculty and staff inside of the university, and another firewall port connected out to the residence halls within the university. Uh, another example in uh, in a corporate uh, in a corporate setting, we might have servers that we want to be available from the internet. Maybe we have our own web server that we host locally. We have our own email server that we host locally. It's in our data center. People on the internet need to be able to access those servers, at least on certain ports. So what we might do is put those publicly available servers in a DMZ. We could still limit some things. We could limit what ports are going to be used. But if somebody were to compromise that web server, we don't want that to become a hop hopping off point to get in and compromise something in the inside network. So we can create this DMZ, which is not going to have permission to start a session in the DMZ and then come in to the inside network. So we can have these different layers of security. So a firewall, that's one appliance that we might have. Another appliance is called an IDS sensor, an intrusion detection system sensor. Here, you'll notice that my IDS sensor is connected in to an Ethernet switch. And when a packet coming in from the internet hits that switch, the switch is making a copy of it. One copy is sent, well, the original packet is sent onto its destination, the client you see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. But the copy that it made, did you see it went down to the IDS sensor? So the IDS sensor is monitoring traffic flowing through that switch. And it's monitoring it for malicious patterns. There is what's called a signature database that the IDS sensor has. And if it sees that there's potentially malicious traffic coming in, it can alert us to that 
In fact, some IDS sensors can even go out and uh, speak to the firewall and say, hey, we're being attacked from this network or from this IP address. I want you to create a rule that says block that IP address from coming in. But notice the packet originally, that might have been a malicious packet that originally came in, it did make it to the client. There are some attacks, they're called atomic attacks, where an attacker can do damage to a system with just one or two packets. In a case like that, the idea sensor might realize we were attacked, but we weren't preventing the attack. To, to overcome that issue, what we can do is use a different type of sensor called an IPS sensor. And an IPS sensor is an intrusion prevention system sensor. So again, an IDS, it inspects traffic and it can react to a copy of the received traffic, but an intrusion prevention system sensor, it's gonna sit in line with the traffic. So when that traffic comes in from the internet, if it detects based on its signature database that this is malicious traffic, it's gonna be able to react and potentially drop that traffic in line. It takes a look at that and says, oh, you match this well-known attack type in my signature database. As a result, I'm gonna drop you. And sometimes, just like we can have a host-based firewall, sometimes we can have a host-based IPS system, uh, an IPS sensor, where we can where we can on our host block traffic coming in our network interface card before it can ever do any damage to our system. So that's the distinction between an IPS and an IDS sensor. So firewalls, IDS sensors, IPS sensors, those are some of the security appliances that we might use. Another line of defense is an access control list or an ACL. If you've gone through your CCNA studies or perhaps Encore studies, then you've probably learned about these access control lists. Let's do a bit of review. To begin with, a lot of people think that an access control list is basically a traffic cop holding up a, uh, a go sign or a stop sign based on traffic coming into a router interface or going out of a router interface. And that's true. It can do that. An access control list, it's a list of rules. Each rule is called an ACE, an ACE, an access control entry. And that ACE is going to be able to say, yes, permit this or deny this. And in addition to permitting or denying traffic, I want you to understand that it can be applied as we send traffic into a router or as traffic is going to exit a router. We can apply it inbound or outbound. So when we're setting up these access control entries as part of our access control list, we need to think about in which direction is the traffic coming. Is it coming into the router or is it going out of the router? And in addition to just permitting or denying traffic, we can also use, and this is a concept often overlooked, we can also match traffic. If I'm doing something like a quality of service or network address translation, I might want to match traffic that's coming from a certain subnet. I could do that with an access control list. And to do that, I would say, I want to permit this network address with this wildcard mask. Well, just because I'm permitting that doesn't mean I'm blocking everything else in the context of using this with quality of service or as network address translation, I'm using it to match traffic. So it's not always used to block or drop traffic or let traffic through. It can be used to match traffic and it's a list and it's processed top down. If the, let, let me give you an example. Let's say that I've got a rule that says everybody in this subnet is prevented. They're denied access to this particular corporate server because of the sensitive information on that server. So nobody in this subnet gets access to the server with one exception. We've got a network administrator that lives in that subnet. What we can do is set up a rule to say, well, I want to allow that network administrator's IP address to reach that system, to reach that server. Well, in my list, if I first say deny the subnet, and then I say permit that one network administrator who belongs to the subnet, they're gonna be denied because we're processing top down. As soon as we look at and evaluate that first ACE that says deny the entire subnet, well, the administrator is part of the subnet, ding, 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 we've got a match, and that administrator's traffic is gonna be dropped. So we need to move their entry that says permit the uh, that specific 
network admin user, we need to move them above the line that says deny the subnet traffic. So as a general principle, we should put more specific entries in our access control list higher in our list because these are processed top down. And once we have a match, we're going to ignore the rest of the entries in that list. But let's say that we go all the way through the list and we don't have a match. Nothing, we didn't have a single access control entry that matched a particular packet. What happens in a case like that? Well, at the bottom of our access control list, of every access control list, we don't create this. It's there by default. We cannot delete this. There's an implicit deny everything rule that says if it was not permitted by a previous access control entry, it's going to be implicitly denied. So we need to, need to keep that in mind. And when we're setting these up, you can use numbered ACLs, you can use named ACLs. Personally, I'm a kind of a fan of the named ACLs. And they can be standard or extended. And I'll give you an example of each coming up in just a moment. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at a standard ACL right now. Here, I've got a couple of subnets off this router. PC1, PC2, they belong to the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 subnet. Got a couple of servers, 192.168.1.0 slash 24. And the goal for our ACL here is I want to prevent traffic from PC1 from reaching the subnet that contains the servers. So in other words, PC2 should be allowed. And notice what we're doing. First, I say, if you'll notice the, uh, the configuration syntax on screen, I'm saying access hyphen list two. Now, now, numbers in the range of 1 through 99, those are going to be used for our standard ACLs. Now, a standard ACL, by the way, that's only going to match the source IP address, not a source TCP port number, not a destination address. It's only matching the source IP address. That's it. So, so it's not as granular. Still, uh, I probably will use a standard ACL every time when I'm setting up NAT because I'm trying to match addresses that are sourced from a subnet. So I don't need something else. But here, I'm saying I want to permit the host of 10.1.1.102. That's PC2. Then I follow that up with the next ACE, which says access hyphen list two. Notice I'm giving the same number. It's part of the same list. I'm saying I want to deny that entire subnet that contains PCs one and two, 10.1.1.0. And instead of a subnet mask, we give the reciprocal of that, the wildcard mask. And that's going to be 0 .0 .0 0.0.255. Would I, would I necessarily had to have given that, that second access control list entry? Actually, no. It's denying traffic. Well, if traffic is not, impl uh, if it's not implicitly, or I should say explicitly permitted, it's going to be implicitly denied. So I could have omitted that second rule and it would have been just fine. Now we're going to apply it. We're going in to interface gig zero slash one. That's the interface facing the PCs. And we say IP access hyphen group. And we give the group number of two or the list number of two. And we say in. So as traffic is going into that router, that's where we're going to evaluate the packets. And that's going to meet our goal. Let's take a look at an extended ACL. Here the goal is for PC1 connect, uh, to be able to connect to server one using TFTP, the trivial file transfer protocol. PC2 should be able to connect to server two using FTP. And I'm, I'm guessing that everything else is going to be denied. So let's take a look at our entries. Access list 101. So uh, starting at 100 through 199, those can be used for extended ACL numbers. So access list 101, permit. And here, I don't have to match an entire subnet or an entire, uh, not a subnet, but match an entire protocol suite like IP. I can match particular protocols. Here, it's I'm going to match trivial file transfer protocol. That's UDP-based. So I say permit UDP. And later on in this line, you'll see that I, I specify the UDP port number. But I wanted to permit the host of 10.1.1.101, uh, that's PC1, to go to a destination. We couldn't specify a destination with standard ACLs, but we can't here. We're going to go to a destination of 192.168.1.2. That's going to be uh, server 1. And then we say EQ69. That is equaling UDP port 69. That is TFTP. We do something similar in the next line. We say access list 101 permit TCP this time for FTP. 
from uh, the host is PC2 and the destination is uh, server2, and we say EQFTP. And I did this to illustrate that sometimes we can specify an individual port number, but Cisco iOS knows about the names of a wide variety of protocols. Check it out sometime with context-sensitive help. So I don't necessarily have to give a port number. I can give a protocol name like FTP. And I did not say deny anything else, even though I said everything else should be denied. Do you remember why? The reason was everything else is going to be implicitly denied if I don't explicitly permit it. Then I go into interface gig 0 slash 1, and I say IPXS hyphen group in. So I'm, I'm specifying coming into router R1 from the subnet containing the PCs. Now let me challenge you with a few examples. Here, you see the syntax currently on router R1, and the goal is to prevent traffic from PC1 from reaching uh, the subnet containing the servers. But the symptom we're having, huh, curious. PC2 is unable to reach the 192.168.1.0/24 network. So PC1 should be denied, but the symptom is both PC1 and PC2 are denied. In fact, so you can see the syntax a bit better. I'm going to make this full screen for you. That'll let you get a better look at it. And I'd like you to, to tell me in the chat, if you would, and we have chats coming in on, on different interfaces here. So uh, I need to be looking around at more than one interface. But, uh, and by the way, there's a delay from the time I speak something to the time you hear it. There can be a 15 second delay. So I'll try not to drag it on too long. But I want you to go ahead and chat in if you would. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this syntax on screen? I'll give you a few seconds and you can chat it in when you spot the issue. All right, starting to get some responses coming in. Let's go through it here. First, it says access list one deny host 10.1.101 or 10.1.1.101, that's PC1. We're denying all traffic from PC1. That's that's what we want to do, awesome. Then we're going into interface gig zero slash one and we're saying block traffic coming into this interface that matched access list one, which is blocking PC1. It, it seems like we're doing what we were told to do. How come it's not working? And yeah, so many of you are getting this right. It's um, It's that implicit deny down at the bottom. I wanted to permit PC2 to get to that subnet, and it's not, it's because that implicit deny anything down at the bottom of our ACL. Awesome work on that one. Let's take a look at another one. In this example, traffic from, in fact, it's the same goal and the same symptom. PC1 should be prevented from reaching the server subnet. PC2 is unable to reach it as well, and we didn't want that. We want PC2 to be able to get there. And if you'll notice in the, uh, in the syntax, I did what you said. You said that we should explicitly permit PC2, so I did. Check it out. It's that second line right there. I added a line that said, permit host 10.1.1.102. That's PC2. So chat it in again if you would. How come that's not working? Yeah, great job. It's because... This is an access control list, and this list is processed top down. So that first ACE, which is denying the entire subnet of 10.1.1.0/24, it matches both PC1 and PC2. So before we explicitly say PC2 is allowed, we explicitly said block the entire subnet that PC2 belongs to. So because we we're processing top down, we never got to the rule permitting PC2, and therefore it was blocked. All right, let's move to an extended ACL now. A little bit more challenging. Here's the goal. PC1 should be able to connect to server one using TFTP. PC2 should be able to connect to server two using FTP. And PC2 is fine, it's working just fine, but PC1 is not able to reach the server via TFTP. This is kind of like what we saw in our example a few moments ago. Again, I'll give you a few seconds to peruse the uh, syntax and chat in your response. What is going wrong here? Yeah, this was a little trickier, wasn't it? In this example, 
everything looks really good, except we have to know that TFTP is a UDP protocol. It's not a TCP protocol. And remember that a standard ACL, it's going to match an entire protocol suite like IP. But, an ex uh, but with an extended ACL, we can match specific ports. And a port is going to be typically either a TCP or a UDP port. And here, that first line says TCP. It should have said UDP. You guys are doing awesome. Let's do one more. Here, we want to allow PC1 to reach server 1 and server 2. Uh, and we want to prevent PC2 from reaching either server. So PC1, go to the servers. PC2, don't go to the servers. The symptom is neither PC can reach either server. And let's take a look at the syntax here. It's an extended ACL, access list 150, that's in that range of 100 through 199, permitting IP, so I'm permitting all IP traffic, TCP and UDP are included. I'm saying permit host 10.1.1.101, that's PC1, to go to that subnet containing the servers, 192.168.1.0 with a wildcard mask of 0.0.0.255, that looks right. Then I'm explicitly denying PC2. I'm saying deny host 10.1.1.102, going to that same subnet. That looks right. And you see I'm going in and I'm applying it. What's wrong here? This looks pretty good, but it's not working. Can anybody, oh, you know what? I don't even need to, to pause here. <laughs> Fantastic job. Lots of people are spotting that I've applied it to the wrong, well, actually, I've either applied it to the wrong interface. I can fix it that way. Notice I'm saying I want to apply this inbound coming into the router on gig 0 slash 2. Well, 0 slash 2, that's the port pointing out to my servers. So I, I could apply it to gig 0 slash 2. That's an option. But if I did that, I would have to apply it in the outbound direction as I exited router R1. So one fix would be to, uh, to just change the direction, change the in to an out. The other fix would be to change my interface to gig 0 slash 1 because there I am coming in from the PC. So either one would have fixed that issue. So we need to apply the access list in the correct direction on the correct interface. Next up, let's talk about encryption. We said encryption is going to scramble our data up such that if somebody intercepts it, they're going to be able to read it. And we have two basic types of encryption. There is symmetric encryption and uh, there is asymmetric encryption. Now, symmetric encryption, let me give you a few examples. A really old example that we definitely do not want to use today. In fact, let me put my face back on screen that we're not looking at our syntax anymore. One standard that we don't want to use today, it was developed back in the 1970s, is DES. That's the data encryption standard. It's a 56, it uses a 56 uh, key or 56 bit key length. There is actually hardware out there that you can build yourself or buy that will crack a DES encrypted string. You don't want to be using that. Now, better than DES is uh, triple DES, they call it, uh, 3DES. That uses three of those keys, and there's different ways of implementing this. You can use 56 bits for one key. You can use 64. There's different ways of doing it. You can combine keys together. Bottom line is, it's a lot better than DES, but you know what's better than triple DES? AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And that is really, today, the flagship symmetric encryption algorithm out there. We're going to see it on our wireless networks. We're going to see it in our IPsec VPN setups. AES, that's, that's probably what we want to be using today. Now, when I say symmetric encryption, that's where we have a shared key. In other words, I'm, uh, we're sending data back and forth, you and I, and we want to encrypt the data that we're sending. So we each have this secret key, and we've got the same one. The key is symmetric, in other words. That means we both have the same key. This symmetric key is going to be used in the algorithm, like AES, that is going to encrypt our data. And if somebody were to intercept that data, they would not be able to interpret that data because they don't know our secret. They don't have our secret key. That's what gives us, that's what gives us confidentiality through encryption. Another option is asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption, and by the way, the standard out there for that that you'll run into is RSA. That stands for the, the people that developed it, uh, Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman. But with asymmetric keys, we have 
keys that we that you and I use to communicate, but they're different. They're called a public-private key pair. Here's the idea. If we want to communicate asynchronously or asymmetrically, I'm going to have a private key and I will give you my public key. Now, here's the way this works. You might want to put this in your notes. If I encrypt something with my public key, or you have my public key, uh, if I encrypt something with the public key or you encrypt something with my public key, it can only be decrypted with my private key. So that means if you encrypt something out there with the public key that I gave you, I'm the only one that can decrypt it because I don't give my private key out to anybody. I will give my public key out to anybody that wants it. So let's say that I gave you my public key and I gave a, a bad actor, a malicious user my public key, and you're want, you want to send some data to me confidentially. Well, you use my public key to scramble things up. What if that malicious user intercepted your traffic that you encrypted with the public key that I gave you? Well, they've got my public key too. Is that bad? Does that mean that because they have the same key that you have, they can now decrypt the data? Well, that would be true with symmetric, but not with asymmetric. With asymmetric, anything encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key, which only I have. So even if they intercept the traffic, they could not they could not decipher it. And the reciprocal of that rule is true as well. If something is encrypted with my private key, it can only be decrypted with my public key. Let me give you some examples to, to make this more real world for us. Let's say that we're trying to communicate from a client to a server, or maybe a wireless access point to a wireless client would use this as well, perhaps. Symmetric encryption, we've got a key that is shared. We put it on the client, we put it on the server, and as they're sending data back and forth, the encryption algorithm we're running, whichever one it is, is going to use as part of that calculation, it's going to use that shared key. And if somebody were to intercept that data, they would not be able to interpret it unless they also had the shared key. So we want to make sure this key is kept secret. But this really doesn't scale very well, does it? Think about this. If I had 5,000 users in the company and uh, we gave everybody the same shared key on their device, what if we had a disgruntled employee that left and they, they took their key with them and uh, maybe they knew what key they configured on their PC? Suddenly, we've got to go around and change the keys on all our thousands of devices. That's no fun. So this is not going to be something that we want to... Uh, that we can scale really large if we have to go to every device individually and configure it with a key. Well, couldn't we just use asymmetric encryption? Yeah, here's the deal with that, something I didn't mention. Asymmetric encryption is, compared to symmetric, slow. I mean, it's slow. Like, I'm talking 100 times slower, or it takes 100 times longer to do asymmetric encryption as compared to symmetric encryption. So asymmetric, we can scale that a bit better, as we'll discuss. That's what we use on the internet oftentimes, but it's a lot slower than symmetric. So let's consider asymmetric. And a common example, I buy stuff from Amazon almost on the daily. Uh, with the, uh, the, the prime truck pulls up in my driveway very, very often. In fact, probably before class is over today, I'm probably going to have a delivery come. So if you hear a doorbell, probably, probably Amazon. But let's say that we're going to go out to Amazon and we want to purchase something and we're going to give our credit card information. So yes, I want it to be secure. Here's what Amazon has. They have something called a digital certificate. And a digital certificate, technically it's it's probably going to be called a, an X.509 version 3 digital certificate. But this is something that proves that they're really Amazon. So when I'm sending them my information, I know I'm truly talking to Amazon. Now, you'll notice on screen we also have this, this server, this entity on the internet called a CA. That, and it depends on what literature you read, sometimes a CA is said to stand for Certificate Authority or Certification Authority. Bottom line is, it's a trusted third party. The first company that comes to mind is uh, VeriSign. Uh, if, uh, if Amazon wants to have this digital certificate to prove its identity to the internet, it can get with VeriSign and say, hey, I want a digital certificate that you have approved, that you've given me, so if I give it to somebody else, one of my customers, they're going to know it's really me. So here's what happens. VeriSign says, all right, Amazon, here is your digital certificate. And here is your private key that I'm giving you. 
So we're using a key pair here. We're using the public-private key pair. Now, as part of that digital certificate, we have Amazon's public key. We'll freely give our public key out to whoever wants it, but we don't give out our private key. Uh, our private key. So VeriSign says, all right, here's your private key. Don't tell anybody what it is. Here's your digital certificate containing your public key. Give that to your customers. And then when I want to go buy something from Amazon, when you see the, depending on your browser, but if you see that little padlock icon in your URL bar, that's saying that this data is encrypted or it's a secure communication. Here's what's happening. Amazon sends us their digital certificate. Their digital certificate contains their, pro, uh, their public key. The question is, how do I know this digital certificate that I just received is really from Amazon? I mean, there could be a malicious user out on the internet that, that's pretending to be Amazon that I got redirected to, and they said, I'm Amazon, here's my proof, here's my uh, digital certificate. Well, the way I know it's really Amazon is that this certificate was signed by a trusted third party. In, in my example, I just picked VeriSign. I don't know if Amazon uses VeriSign or not, but uh, VeriSign has signed the digital certificate to say, I validate this is really Amazon you're dealing with. What does it mean to sign a digital certificate? Well, the VeriSign or the CA, they have encrypted that digital certificate with their private key. Remember the rule? If something is encrypted with somebody's private key, it can only be decrypted with their public key. And we have VeriSign's public key. Let's go through this one, one step at a time. So Amazon, they've got a public and private key pair. VeriSign has said, here's your private key. Don't tell anybody. Here's your public key. Put that in your certificate. Give it to whoever you want. And I want to go to Amazon to buy something. So I say, I want to establish a secure connection so I can send my credit card info. And Amazon says, okay, here is my digital certificate. And this digital certificate contains the public key of Amazon. I've highlighted it for you here on screen. Now, how do I know this is really from Amazon? Well, notice it says it's signed by VeriSign. And built into my browser, depending on what browser you use, you can probably dig around in some of the security, uh, security settings, and you can actually see the digital certificates from these trusted third parties like VeriSign that are literally built into your browser. So you're given, when you install your browser, you're given the public key for VeriSign. And VeriSign has signed this certificate from Amazon. They've encrypted it with their private key. You've got VeriSign's public key. So if you can decrypt this certificate coming from Amazon, you realize, based on VeriSign's public key, you realize, oh yeah, this is really from Amazon because I used VeriSign's public key to unlock it because they, they locked it or they signed it with their private key. So now I know for a fact this really came from Amazon and I have Amazon's public key in my possession right now. But I don't want to use symmetric encryption. Like I said, it's slow. So let's set up a shared key just for the duration of this session. What I'm going to do is I'm going to generate, my PC is going to generate some big string, some big random string, and I want to use that as the symmetric key that Amazon and I will use during this session. So what I'm going to do is take this string of data, and I'm going to encrypt it using Amazon's public key. And if I do that, if somebody intercepts it, is that a problem? It's not a problem because if I encrypt it with Amazon's public key, it can only be decrypted with their private key and they don't give that to anybody. So we send this over to Amazon and if anybody intercepts it, they don't have Amazon's private key, it's still secured. But Amazon, they've got a private key. So Amazon is gonna be able to decrypt this big random string that my computer came up with. And based on that, it's gonna say, oh, Here's the key that I see you want to use for this session. So now I've got the same session key that Amazon does. For the duration of the session and just with me, Amazon and I are going to use that to do symmetric encryption. So you see what we're saying here? It's really the best of both worlds. We don't have to give everybody, everybody on the internet a symmetric key to talk to Amazon. We use this public-private asymmetric key pair. And then based on that key pair, I can generate a symmetric key. All right, that's, uh, I think that's just amazing how that works.
But uh, another goal of security, you said, was integrity. We want to make sure that data has not been modified or, or scrambled up. And when I say integrity, we can run a mathematical check. It's called a hashing algorithm. And a lot of people confuse hashing with encryption. So let me, uh, let me distinguish between those for a moment. Hashing and encryption are quite different. If I have a big, if I take one of those Cisco Press books off my bookshelf, for example, behind me, and I encrypt it, it's going to be a big, thick book pretty much as, as well. It's going to be huge because I'm encrypting like 600 pages. But if I run the hashing algorithm, like the MD5 algorithm, the Message Digest 5 algorithm on one of those Cisco Press books, it's going to generate a 125-bit, uh, excuse me, 128-bit result. That's called a hash digest. Think of that as a fingerprint. It's not an encryption that can be extracted or decrypted. It's a fingerprint. And one hashing algorithm is MD5, Message Digest 5. And the idea is, if I take the fingerprint and I say, here's the Message Digest that I calculated, and I send the data to you, you run that same algorithm, and you come up with the same fingerprint, if the fingerprints match, that's a good indication that the data has not been modified in transit. If I took a, a, a instead of a book, let's say I took a three-letter word like cat, and I, I did a hashing algorithm like MD5 on the word cat, it would also result in 128 bits. See, it doesn't matter how big the string is that we're hashing, if we're using MD5, the result is always going to be a 128-bit hash digest. So uh, this is not something that we're going to decrypt. It's just to make sure that the fingerprints match. MD5, pretty good. Cisco's used it for decades. But even better than MD5 is SHA. That stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. So you got the option. I'd probably use SHA. It's, it's considered to be more secure. Here's a challenge we have, though. Let's say that you're sending me some... You're sending me some data. And you said, oh, by the way, here's the MD5 hash that I've calculated for this file that you're downloading. So you give me your string and you give me your file. Well, I'm going to run the MD5 algorithm on that file and I'm going to generate my own string. And if my string or if my MD5, uh, MD5 hash matches your string, your hash, then that's a good indication that things have not been modified. However, what if you send me this file and midway through that transmission, a malicious user gets that file, they change it up, and then they run the MD5 algorithm themselves. They've got a key, or not a key, they've got a hash digest based on that altered file. And they send it to me saying, here's the, uh, here's the file and here's your message digest. Well, I'm going to run my MD5 algorithm on that uh, same file that they've altered, and I'm going to get the same hash digest that they got. You see, somebody has encrypted or somebody's altered it in transit, and they changed the, the digest. What do I do to fight that? Well, to overcome that limitation, there's something called HMAC, hash-based message. Let's try that again. Hash-based message authentication code. That adds a secret key to the mix. So when that hash is being calculated with uh, HMAC, it's going to use that secret key. And somebody that intercepts that, they intercept our file, and they try to run the, the algorithm on uh, the file, they don't know the secret key that we're using. So they're not going to be able to create a believable or a valid hash digest. And I'll detect that when I receive the file and their string. And finally, as we're talking about the three big goals of security, there is high availability. We don't want to be denied access to our systems. We want our systems to be highly available. But what does highly available really mean? I, I, was, I heard some, I forget what it was, some service the other day I heard advertised, and they said something like, you know, we've got 99.9% .9 availability. And I thought, 999 .9? That's really not that good. <laughs> That's a lot of downtime uh, over the period of a year. Really, the sort of the gold standard for availability is called the five nines of availability. That means that we're up 99.999% of the time. And if you translate that into a amount of time we might be down per year, it's about five minutes. It's really hard to achieve, by the way. It can be very expensive, but really that's kind of the gold standard. 
there, you may have also heard the six nines of availability. That means you're up 99.9999% of the time. And that's going to give you only about 30 seconds of downtime per year. That's, uh, that's for your really super high availability systems. But generally, five nines, that's what we're shooting for. And some things that could get in the way of that is malicious users. They might send us some improperly formatted data that can maybe cause an operating system to crash. We're going to talk later today about DOS and DDoS attacks. And to prevent that, we want to make sure that our operating system security patches are up to date. We might want to use some of those firewall appliances like we talked about. In fact, Cisco uses this term that I love the metaphor. They talk about security in depth. They, they talk about overlapping layers of security. Another, I, I use the metaphor of I'm in bed on a cold winter's night and uh, it's really cold in the room and I've got a blanket over me, but my feet are sticking out. So I, I put another blanket over my feet and oh, I got an elbow over here that's sticking out. And I, so I tuck that under another blanket. I've got these overlapping blankets. So there are some areas that, that are covered by multiple blankets. Some of them might just be covered by one blanket, but by giving overlapping layers of protection, I'm completely protected. Same thing with the network. We don't just buy a firewall and say, we're protected. I have a security appliance. No, we want to have overlapping layers of network security. And we talked about some of those. and We'll talk about more as the day goes on. But that's going to wrap up module two, the three big goals of network security. In module three, we want to take a look at uh, just, again, at sort of a high level, some common network attacks and how we might defend ourselves against some of those attacks. And let's get started with what I would say one of the more popular attacks out there that you hear about on the news a lot, DOS or denial of service, and DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks. First, let's talk about a DOS attack, a denial of service. This is where we've got one individual malicious user, and they're trying to deny service to a system. So here we've got our malicious user on the... I, I'm trying to avoid using the word hacker as much as I can because I realize hackers aren't inherently bad. There are, there are white hat hackers. There are, there are good people that are hackers. Uh, hackers can, uh, the term hacker can take on different meanings in different contexts. So I don't want to come across as saying all oh, hackers are bad. That's not the case. So I'm, I'm trying to say malicious user, but if I slip up and say hacker, I'm probably meaning a malicious user. But we've got a malicious user on the left-hand side of the screen, and they're targeting this victim at an IP address of 192.0.2.123. And there's different ways that we might do this, but this attacker is going to send what is called a ping of death. That's a dramatic cut name, isn't it? It's going to send a ping of death to this victim. Specifically, the attacker is going to lie about who they are. They're going to spoof their IP address and they're going to claim to be our victim's IP address. They're going to claim to be 192.0.2.123. And they're going to do a ping, not to a specific IP address, they're going to ping an entire subnet using a, the directed broadcast of a subnet. Remember, a directed broadcast address goes to everybody within that subnet. So they're saying, they're spoofing, they're lying about their source IP address. They're saying it's 192.0.2.123, and they're pinging the uh, the broadcast or uh, the uh, the broadcast address of that network they're pinging 198.150 or .51.100.255 and when they go to that directed broadcast the response from every device in that subnet comes out and bam they all hit that victim at once and this can just continue on and on and that poor victim machine they're so busy trying to deal with that onslaught of, of ping responses they might not be able to do their regular job now, that's with one attacker trying to flood a victim with a lot of traffic, and they were leveraging a directed broadcast to do that. But we hear a lot, probably a more destructive type of attack than a DOS is a DDoS, or a distributed denial of service attack. Here, instead of just one, one malicious user trying to flood a victim with lots of traffic, they, over time, can infect devices around the world, maybe tens of thousands of devices around the world. And they're going to be able to to infect them with, with malware, perhaps, and uh, they're going to become under the control of our attacker. Now, these infected machines sometimes are called bots, sometimes are called uh, zombies, and this attacker, when they get ready to launch the attack against their intended victim, they're going to talk to a server that they have called uh, their command and control server. That's going to coordinate instructions going out from that command and control uh, server 
to these infected bots or these zombies. It's it's literally the rise of the zombies here. We're talking from the command and control server to these infected computers around the world, and we simultaneously have them all rise up and start attacking our intended victim. So by maybe getting some malware into the hands of users around the world, pretending to be maybe a, a game, some sort of other application, or maybe you, we have some malicious code on a web page that infects them, we can then, or the attacker can control them and say, all right, attack. And simultaneously, they all attack the victim. And if we've got tens of thousands of computers around the internet, that's more likely to do damage than just a single user trying to generate a lot of traffic targeting, targeting a system. How do we protect against that? It sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Well, here are some, here are some general guidelines, and uh, this is some content that I've taken from uh, CEH. Uh, Charles taught some of those modules. I taught some of the modules. This is from a module that I taught, and it's talking about how we can defend against DOS and DDoS attacks. And we'll talk about each of these. TCP routers have a TCP intercept feature. We've already talked about the IPS sensor. There are some detection algorithms. Uh, we might want to give more bandwidth than we need to handle the excess traffic during an attack. Know what we're going to do in response to attack with an incident response plan. And we might want to pay somebody to attack our network th that we know about so that they can detect any weaknesses before the bad actors detect, detect any weaknesses. But let's talk about these one at a time, beginning with this uh, TCP intercept feature. Remember how TCP works? It's a three-way handshake. If I want to set up a conversation with you, I'll send you a synchronization message, uh, an S-Y-N, a SYN message. And I, I'm saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And you respond with an acknowledgement saying, okay, I'm willing to let that happen. You can talk to me. Oh, by the way, I want to talk to you too. So you'll send me a SYN of your own. So I send you a SYN saying, let's talk. You send me a SYN act saying, I want to talk to you, and yes, I acknowledge your sin. And then I'll acknowledge your sin with my own act. So here's the three-way handshake. Sin, sin act, act. That's how a TCP session is set up. Now, the attacker is sending a synchronization message into router R1, and with the TCP intercept feature, R1, before it passes the traffic on to the target server, one option for setting this up is to have the router itself participate in that handshake. So the target server, anybody on the inside of the network, they don't even become involved until the router has confirmed that this session is fully established. So on behalf of our server, in this example, the router is responding with a SYN ACK. And the attacker responds with an ACK. And once the three-way handshake is set up, then the message, or then a session is set up between the router and the target server and they're tied together. So the attacker or the person on the internet, we don't know if they're bad or not yet, they're then talking to the target server. But what, a, what that malicious user might do is send a flood of synchronization or send messages saying, hey, let's set up a session. Let's set up a session. Let's set. They just flood it over and over. And every time they do, the poor router saying, okay, here's my SYNAC. Okay, here's my SYNAC. We're t if we flood this router with all these send messages, but we never respond to the send act that they send back to that the router sends back to to the attacker, then the router resources are being consumed. They've got what are called half open connections, or sometimes in the literature they'll be called embryonic connections. They're not fully formed connections, and these connections, if there's enough of them, will consume our router resources thus giving us a denial of service attack on the router. So here's something I used to do years ago back at the university where I was the uh, network engineer. Uh, we set up this TCP intercept feature and there's two modes we could operate in. The intercept mode is what we saw in the animation a moment ago. That's where the router is gonna make sure this is a valid session before we ever get somebody on the inside of the network involved. They're gonna to respond to the send messages on behalf of the inside users. And if it's not set up, we don't have to have the server on the inside deal with all these half open connections. Uh, the router is going to deal with that. Or we could be more passive. The router could be in a watch mode. And in watch mode, we're, we're looking at what's going on. We're watching the traffic go. We see the send message. I see you send message. You're going to that target server on the inside. We made a note of that. And we'll let it happen until we exceed some threshold where there have been too many send messages sent within a certain period of time. At that point, the router gets involved and, and starts blocking things. Another way to prevent or to mitigate those DOS and DDoS attacks, something we've already talked about, an IPS sensor. 
where we can have this signature of well-known attacks. And those well-known attacks, if, we, if they match a signature in that signature database, we can block them in line. And this signature database could be something that we update regularly as, as part of our weekly routine. Or sometimes, sometimes we can integrate our IPS sensor with an online service that keeps up-to-date information about threats like day zero attacks that are emerging on the internet. Cisco has something called Cisco Talos and we can integrate our Cisco IPS sensor with Cisco Talos and it's going to tell us and it's going to give us information about these hot spots around the world that are having security breaches and we can see what, uh, what the current signatures are that we're trying to protect against. One of the toughest things to block with a DOS or a DDoS attack is called a zero day attack. This is where a user for the very first time, or a malicious user, they launch for the very first time an attack and it's not in our signature database. How do we detect something that we don't have a record of? Well, there are zero day attacks can be somewhat mitigated by integrating with an online system like Talos that's gonna give us very quick updates when those are detected. But even beyond that, Cisco can use, as part of their uh, Firepower Firewall series, they can use machine learning to detect what it estimates to be malicious traffic. Even though it's never been detected and logged before, it's not in our signature database, yeah, Cisco Firepower might be able, through machine learning again, to detect what it suspects to be malicious traffic and then isolate or block that traffic. And that's available on the 9300 series as an example, uh, Cisco Firepower Firewall. Cisco also recommends that to protect against a DOS or a DDoS attack, we can over-provision our bandwidth because when we are being attacked with a flood of traffic coming in, that flood of traffic is going to be consuming extra bandwidth coming into our network. So even if our router is keeping a log of all those send messages and we're blocking stuff and we're recognizing malicious traffic, it's still coming over the pipe to us. So during the time where we're detecting and responding to that attack, it might be a good idea to have some extra bandwidth on that link. So if we do have that flood of traffic coming in, we're better able to handle that and we're not getting a denial of service on our internet link, as an example. And when we are under attack, it's great if we know what we're going to do in response because sometimes... Honestly, I, I see a lot of emotion in networking when things go wrong or when attacks happen. Some people can kind of freak out. Ah, we're under attack. What do we do now? Let's unplug everything. Now, it's a lot better that instead of trying to come up with a response in the heat of the moment under the pressure of we're under attack, if you have previously <laughs> with a clear mind documented what you're going to do in response. You've got a plan of action. So, oh, we're under attack. Let's execute this plan. Bam, we're going to do this, this, and notify these people. We're going to set this up. We're going to make this rule. We're going to update this. We're going to have a step-by-step -step plan of how we've pre-decided to respond to any future attacks. It's going to make things go a lot quicker, a lot smoother, with a lot less stress. And another option for protecting against these DOS and DDoS attacks is to recognize any vulnerabilities before the bad people recognize your vulnerabilities. You might see this in a movie or a TV show sometimes where, uh, in a bank maybe. Sometimes a, a bank will pay somebody to see if they could break into their bank. And, uh, and if they can, they come into the conference room, they, they put down the big duffel bag and it's full of this money. Yeah, I got all this from your vault and here's what I did to get in. You might want to patch these security breaches. Well, the same thing with, uh, with our networks. We can pay somebody to do penetration testing. In fact, there's a, there's a certification, uh, Pen Test Plus from CompTIA, that uh, trains you to be a, a pen tester. But this is an authorized attack on a system. We know somebody's attacking our system and it's not to do bad things to our system, it's to evaluate our current posture, our current level of, uh, of, of security and identify any vulnerabilities that we might need to address. Another type of attack is an on-path attack uh, or sometimes this used to be called a man in the middle. You'll hear it called either one on-path or man in the middle. But the idea is We've got somebody sitting between the source and destination of, of our communication flow. And here, I've got a couple of computers that are talking back and forth to each other, no problem. But what if an attacker comes along? If an attacker comes along and plugs into this switch, and it starts getting copies of traffic going between those PCs, 
they might be able to decrypt that traffic. Maybe that traffic's not even being sent in clear text. Maybe they can have one system send their traffic to them, they modify it or they capture it, and then they send it to the destination. But, but how would that work? I mean, think about this. One of the great things we love about a Cisco Cat or an Ethernet switch in general is that the switch is going to build a MAC address table. It's going to learn what MAC addresses are available off of different ports. Then when traffic comes in, let's say from one of these laptops, and it looks at the destination, and the destination is the other laptop, it's going to say, oh, that lives off this port. So I'm only going to send the traffic out of that port. We're not going to send anything to this attacker that just plugged in. How, how would that even work? How can, the, how can that attacker inject themselves into this conversation when a switch, by its nature, prevents that? That's what we're about to talk about. I want to talk about three different ways that an attacker might launch a man in the middle or an on-path attack. One option is to flood the MAC address database of this switch. Just to give you a preview, this switch, I think, holds a little over 8,000 MAC addresses in its MAC address table. What if it were full? If that MAC address table were completely full and somebody plugged in, would their MAC address be learned? No. There's no room to store that newly attached machine's MAC address. So if I'm sending traffic to that new machine that just attached and I did not learn its MAC address, how do I get it to that machine? I don't know where it lives. I'm going to flood it. The switch is going to flood that traffic out of all ports other than the port on which that frame arrived. So that's one way that an attacker might inject themselves. They fill up the MAC address table of a switch so a newly attached device, that traffic going to that newly attached device is going to be flooded out of all ports, including the port to which the attacker is attached. We'll also talk about ARP poisoning, where we might actually convince, convince an end system and convince a router that they should send our traffic to us instead of the router or that, that end system. And if we can use our DHCP server to, uh, to inform a client about IP address information and DNS information and default gateway information, we could direct them to us as their default gateway. Or we could direct them to our DNS server. So if they're trying to go to a social media site, perhaps, we direct them to what looks like a social media site. But it's really something under our control and we're capturing their credentials when they attempt to log in. So let's talk about each one of these. First, I discussed how we can fill up the MAC address table of a switch and... If we do that, a newly attached device is not going to have their MAC address learned. Here's what an attacker might do. The attacker might send from their one PC a series of frames into the switch, but using an application, uh, Mac of, Mac Overflow is what that's short for, but using an application like that or one we just write ourselves, that attacker can send just thousands upon thousands of, of frames within just a matter of seconds into the switch. And it's going to, we're going to claim that each frame is from a different MAC address. And it's going to think that there are like 8,000 MAC addresses living off of this one port, which is possible. I mean, if, we, if that one port connected to a switch that connected to a bunch of other switches that connected to a bunch of other switches and they have PCs, yeah, we, we could potentially have 8,000, not likely, but we can have 8,000 devices off of a single port in a case like that. But an attacker might use this uh, application called MacOv that we uh, it comes built in with Kali Linux, I think. Uh, here's a little video of me doing it on Kali Linux. And within about three seconds, I filled up the MAC address table of, of this very switch. And here is a, uh, a show MAC address table count that I did after about three seconds of this flooding using MacOv. And it says that this switch was capable of storing 8,170 MAC addresses and right now, how many are available? Zero. In about three seconds, I sent over 8,000 frames into that switch, each claiming to be from a different MAC address, and it completely saturated and filled up that MAC address table. By the way, I'm, gonna, I'm about to show you in a live demo how we can fight against that using a feature called uh, port security. Something else that might happen is um, a DHCP attack. With the DHCP attack, we're trying to convince a user to come to our rogue DHCP server and get information from us. If we can send them information saying, here's your IP address and here's your default gateway, what if we give, if we're the attacker, what if we give our IP address as the default gateway? Well, suddenly that poor unsuspecting victim 
all the traffic leaving their subnet, they're sending to us. We might capture it, we might alter it, and then we'll send it on to its intended destination so that they're none the wiser because it does get to the destination after we captured it. So we don't want to have a rogue DHCP server be believed. But here's one way that an attacker might launch a DHCP starvation attack. Sort of like using all the MAC address space in the MAC address table with the MAC of utility, the attacker might use a utility called Yersinia that comes with uh, Kali Linux. And uh, this Yersinia utility can send just a flood of DHCP discover broadcast out of the network. Uh, and uh, those might reach the corporate DHCP server and they say, yeah, I'm a DHCP server. And we could say, all right, give me an IP address and, and here's my MAC address. So kind of like that MAC address flooding attack, we're sending a bunch of traffic again into that uh, DHCP server saying, give me an IP address, give me an IP address because I'm giving all these phony MAC addresses. Well, that corporate DHCP server, it's only got so many addresses in a pool to hand out. And in a matter of just a few seconds, we could completely deplete that pool. So now, if somebody, uh, if the attacker adds a rogue DHCP server to the network, what's going to happen when a laptop boots up? It's going to send out that DHCP discover broadcast saying, hey, are there any DHCP servers out there? Well, the corporate DHCP server is not going to respond because it's full. It has no addresses to hand out. But the attacker's newly introduced rogue DHCP server, it's going to respond. And that, that's going to be an issue for us. And then the victim might be told to come to the attacker first before, uh, as their default gateway. The attacker captures the traffic and then the attacker forwards the traffic out to the internet. A defense against this, and I'm going to show you a defense against this, is port security. Port security, uh, which is also going to be how we defend against that MAC flooding attack. Another type of DHCP attack is DHCP spoofing. This is similar, and it can be used in conjunction with the DHCP starvation attack. But, but let's, let's take a moment and review, just to make sure we're all on the same page, how DHCP works. It's uh, If you ever watched uh, Dora the Explorer on, I think it was Nickelodeon, uh, my daughters used to watch that when they were young. But uh, Dora uh, had, uh, there was Backpack and Map, and uh, oh, just recently, there's I saw on TV there was a uh, there was a new Dora, like some sort of lost gold temple. I forget the name of it, but there's a live action Dora the Explorer movie that came out, and I thought, oh, I bet that would be cool. It's like Indiana Jones only with Dora the Explorer. I know my kids love that. That'd be fun to watch. Yikes! I made it about okay. Here's my movie review. Don't watch it. I made it about ten minutes, and it was so boring. I couldn't stand it. Maybe it's made for children. Maybe that was my bad. But did not enjoy the movie. But in general. I got fond memories of uh, my little girls watching Dora back in the day. And I think of Dora everything I, every time I think of DHCP. Because Dora, D-O-R-A, that reminds me of the four-step process of how we get an IP address. The D is the discover. We send out a broadcast saying, hey, are there any DHCP servers out there? And every DHCP server that hears that discover broadcast is going to respond with the O in Dora and offer saying, yes, I'm a DHCP server. And whichever offer we receive first, if there are multiple responses, that's what the client's going to use. It's going to then send the R in door a request saying, could you give me some IP address information? And then that server responds with the A in door, the acknowledgement saying, yeah, here's all your IP address information. Here's your address. Here's your subnet mask. Here's your default gateway. Here's your DNS server and on and on and on. And normally the client is going to send out the discover broadcast. It's going to go to the corporate DHCP server. It's going to say, yes, I'm a I'm a valid DHCP server. Feel free to use me for your IP addressing needs. The client's going to say, okay, I would like to formally request some IP address info. And the server's going to give it to us in the form of an acknowledgement message. But what if an attacker attack, uh, attaches their rogue DHCP server to this switch? When the client sends out its DHCP broadcast, it's going everywhere within the subnet or if we have a DHCP relay agent set up, it might be going to a different subnet. But we're, the rogue server attaches to the same subnet that the corporate DHCP server is attached to, and th it receives the Discover broadcast as well. Now, not every time, but a percentage of the time, its offer message might reach the client before the offer message from the legitimate corporate DHCP server. And since in this case, the client received the rogue DHCP server's offer message first, it's going to say, all right, I'm choosing you because you're quick on the job. We're going to ask you to give me information and we're given false information. How do we protect ourselves against that? 
Well, we can set up a feature called DHCP snooping on our Cisco Catalyst switches. What we do there is we say what port is trusted and what port or ports are untrusted. We'll say that a port is trusted if it does connect out to our legitimate DHCP server. So here, the first port on the switch, that connects to my legitimate corporate DHCP server. And we'll say it's trusted. Everybody else is going to be untrusted. Now, what does untrusted mean? Untrusted means if I receive a DHCP offer message coming into this port, it's going to be dropped if it's untrusted. So in this case, the Discover broadcast goes out. Both DHCPs, the good one and the bad one, they both respond. But when the offer message from the attacker tries to come into the switch, bam, it's going to be dropped because it is coming, trying to come in on an untrusted port. And I'm going to show you in a live interface in just a few moments. In fact, we'll, we'll configure it on this switch. I'll show you how to set up DHCP uh, snooping. I think you'll really enjoy that. Another way that a, an on-path attack might be launched is with ARP poisoning. Remember how ARP works when a PC gets its IP address information uh, and it wants to go out to the internet, for example? It knows, in this case, the victim's laptop knows that its default gateway is 10.1.1.1. But the very first time it tries to talk to 10.1.1.1, it, it doesn't know the, the MAC address of 10.1.1.1. How does it learn it? It learns it by using an ARP, an address resolution protocol broadcast. It says, hey, can anybody tell me the MAC address of 10.1.1.1? And the router says, oh, yeah, that's me. I have the MAC address of all A's, we'll pretend. And by the way, that frame that came in from the victim's laptop, it came in from the victim's laptop MAC address of all C's. So the router just updated its ARP cache to know that the victim's laptop at 10.1.1.100, it's got a MAC address of all C's. Well, the router responds and says, yep, I'm the old uh, A's MAC address. I'm 10.1.1.1. And the PC says, thank you very much. And the PC updates its ARP cache. So now the laptop and the router, they know one another's MAC address. And the laptop sends a frame to the MAC address of its default gateway, which is then going to get it out to the internet. What if an attacker comes along though, and that attacker is able to convince both the PC and the router that traffic should be sent to it? Uh, here's what I mean. The, the attacker is gonna send what are called gratuitous ARP replies. In other words, the PC is not asking for MAC address information. It's good. It's populated its uh, IP ARP, uh, its ARP cache. It's all good. But the attacker sends unsolicited or gratuitous ARP replies saying, <clears throat> just like you to know that 10.1.1.1, it's got a MAC address of all Bs. That's the MAC address of the attacker. And the victim's laptop gets that and says, oh, thanks so much. I was going I thought, it, silly me. I thought it was the all A's MAC address. Let me update my ARP cache to reflect that when I want to go to 10.1.1.1, I'm going to go to the all B's MAC address. So you see what just happened here? When the victim tries to go out to its default gateway, it's going to go to the attacker. Now the attacker also wants to convince the router that it is the laptop. So it's going to send a gratuitous ARP to the router saying, 10.1.1.100, uh, that's me. I've got the all B's MAC address. And the router says, oh, thanks for the update. And it updates its ARP cache. So now... But just lying about this, the attacker has logically injected themselves into this path. And traffic going between the PC and the router, as you can see, it's flowing through the attacker's laptop where they might be capturing traffic. They might be altering traffic. This is called an ARP poisoning attack. And I'm going to show you, there's a feature that works hand in hand with uh, DHCP snooping called dynamic ARP inspection that can prevent this type of thing from happening. In fact, let's go out to a live interface right now. I'll make this full screen so you can see it a bit better. And here we're sitting on uh, switch SW1. That's the uh, Cisco Catalyst 2960 CG that I've been showing you throughout today's session. And let's set up these three features. First of all is port security. That's going to help us defend against that Mac flooding attack. It's going to help defend, uh, help defend us against the uh, DHCP starvation attack as well. What it does, it's going to limit the number of Mac addresses that can be learned off of a single interface. Let's go into global configuration mode, and let's just set up the first port on the switch. Let's go into interface gig 0 slash 1. And there's a requirement of a port to, uh, to do port security. That port must be an access port. 
So I'm going to say switch port mode access as opposed to dynamic or as opposed to trunk. It's going to be an access port. Now I can turn on port security with the command switch port port hyphen security. Now with port security, we said that we could specify the maximum number of MAC addresses that are learnable off of a, off of a single port. Let's set that to, I don't know. I'll, sometimes we're running virtual machines. I, I run a lot of virtual machines on my Mac. If I want to run like Microsoft Windows 11, for example, I like to give myself about four or five Mac addresses per port just, uh, just to account for things like that. So let's set, set this up to allow, let's say four Mac addresses. I'll say switch port, port security, still in interface configuration mode. And I'll say maximum, to, um, no, let's say maximum four. I'll allow four Mac addresses to be learned. And now that we've said we're going to learn a maximum of four MAC addresses on this port, the next decision we have to make is what if a fifth MAC address shows up? How do we respond to that? Well, we've got options. We could say what our violation action is going to be. Uh, and I'll show you that in just a moment, but I want to show you something else first. Those maximum, the maximum number of MAC addresses, do they have to be specific MAC addresses? Well, they could be. Let me show you. I could say switch port, port hyphen security. And I could give a series of MAC addresses. I could say MAC hyphen address, and I could configure one MAC address. I could enter the command again to configure another one and another one and another one. I could, con that's a lot of work. I probably don't want to do that manually. What I can do instead is say sticky. If I say sticky, then it's going to dynamically learn the first four MAC addresses that it sees on this port, and it's going to put it in the running configuration. So later after that's happened, maybe I come back the next day and, and I save my configuration. It's the first four MAC addresses that were learned. So we'll, we'll assume those are the, four MAC, uh, are the four MAC addresses that should be on this port. So we could manually configure them, we could sticky learn them, or we could just let whoever the first four are be the, first, or be the four that are allowed. But I was hinting a moment ago at uh, making a decision as to how we respond to a violation. What if a fifth MAC address shows up? Well, what's our violation options? Let's say switch port, port hyphen security, violation, and we have we've got three options. Protect, restrict, and shutdown. First of all, let's, let's talk about protect. Now, protect says, in this case, I'm learning a maximum of four MAC addresses. If a fifth MAC address shows up and tries to send traffic into that switch, traffic coming from that fifth MAC address, we're going to drop traffic from it. Everybody else from the other four MAC addresses, we'll leave those undisturbed so that nothing gets inter interrupted. We'll just block traffic from that fifth MAC address that shows up. The restriction, uh, restrict option is very, very similar to protect. With restrict, we're still going to drop frames coming from MAC address number five or, or MAC address number six. We're still doing that. We're still not interrupting anybody else, but we're going to increment something called the switch's security violation counter. So there's going to be a log that a violation did occur. We're not interrupting the first four legitimate MAC addresses, but at least we'll have a record that a violation did occur. I'll show you how to, how to view that here in just a moment. But um, in fact, let me just show you that right. Well, I'll, I'll show you after I give the violation option. But I'm going to say my viola violation option is restrictive. I want to make a log but not interrupt the first four MAC addresses. Or I could be very restrictive and say, I could say shutdown. Uh, shutdown says if there is a violation, then something must be up. Something Something's not good in the neighborhood right now. So I'm going to block everybody. I'm going to put this port into what's called an air disable state. And we're going to remain in that state until we either after a period of time, try to come out of that state or somebody bounces the interface. Now I'm going to say restrict. That's kind of my go-to one. And I could say show switch port or actually show port hyphen security. And here's that security violation counter that I was talking about. So if we did have a violation, somebody tried to exceed the four MAC addresses on port gig zero slash one, that would be that would be recorded here in the security violation counter. So again, that's how easy it is to set up port security, and that could defend us against that MAC flooding attack. It could defend us against that DHCP starvation attack. Next up is DHCP snooping. 
Remember, with DHCP snooping, we want to say what port is trusted or untrusted. And if a port is untrusted, we're going to drop any DHCP offer packets coming into that port. So here, I'm going to turn it on globally. I'll say IP DHCP snooping, and that turns it on globally. But the thing is, even though I've turned it on globally, it's not yet active for any of our VLANs. You have to turn it on for a VLAN at a time. Now, in my case, I've only got one VLAN. It's VLAN 1. So I'm going to say IP DHCP snooping VLAN 1. And let's go into interface gig 0 slash 1 again that we were using. And I'll say IP DHCP snooping trust. Let's pretend that gig 0 slash 1, that's the port off of which my legitimate corporate DHCP server resides. I, I can... Uh, I can then start dropping traffic that comes in any other port. I can say show IP DHCP snooping. And you can see that I am trusting gig 0 slash 1. Everybody else is going to be untrusted, which means I'm going to be dropping any traffic that comes in, or any specifically DHCP offer messages that try to come in any other port other than gig 0 slash 1. There's one other feature, I'll, uh, by the way, this is going to help fight that DHCP spoofing attack. But remember the uh, the ARP poisoning attack? Let's see how we can defeat that or def better defend against that. We can use something called DAI, Dynamic ARP Inspection. And with Dynamic ARP Inspection, we're actually leveraging a table that gets built with our DHCP snooping configuration. I mean, the DHCP snooping configuration that I set up, it was pretty simple. I turned it on, I enabled it for a VLAN, and I said what port was trusted. We're done. But in addition to just blocking offer messages coming in other ports, there is a table that it is constructing in the background. And that table is saying what, uh, it's snooping in on these DHCP messages. It's not just looking for offer messages, it's actually reading the contents of these DHCP messages. It knows that a specific IP address with a specific MAC address lives off of this specific port. So it can, with dynamic ARP inspection, if it starts to receive information that is inconsistent with what has been learned via DHCP, it can drop that traffic. Let's, let me show you how to turn that on. Let's go back into global configuration mode and I'll say I want to turn on IP ARP inspection for VLAN 1. And let's say that I want to trust just that first port again. I'll say interface gig 0 slash 1. So don't examine traffic off of this port. I'll say IP ARP inspection trust. Everybody else is going to be untrusted. So now DHCP snooping is going to be building that table. And if there's information or packet showing up on a particular port that's inconsistent with the MAC address IP assignments that have been handed out by the DHCP server, like if somebody's falsifying their MAC address, then that's going to be denied. It's going to be blocked. So that's a look at three different tools that we can use to better defend ourselves against these kinds of attacks, these, uh, these on-path attacks. We took a look at how to configure uh, port security. We took a look at how to configure DHCP snooping, and building on that, we configured DHCP snooping first, but building on that, we then configured DAI, Dynamic ARP Inspection. Next up, let's take a look at a few other attacks, and uh, we are going to be taking our first break here coming up in just a moment. I realize we've been going for a while, but I want to take a look at a few other attacks first, and the next one is a VLAN hopping attack. With a VLAN hopping attack, an attacker might be trying to get access to a VLAN that might, contain, that might contain some secure server that it should not have access to. So there's security in place that says you're not allowed person in VLAN 1 from getting over here to VLAN 5. One way of getting access to a forbidden VLAN is to do switch spoofing. In other words, the attacker's machine, it can pretend to be a switch. Do you remember the protocol that's used? by a Cisco Catalyst switch to dynamically form a trunk. Go ahead and chat it in if you remember that. What protocol is used by a Cisco Catalyst switch that can dynamically form a trunk? And remember, a trunk by default allows traffic for all VLANs to flow over that trunk. Yeah, it's, it's DTP, the Dynamic Trunk Protocol. Great job. The Dynamic Trunk Protocol. So using a, util, uh, using a tool like Yersinia, that's, another, that's one of those tools that's available in Kali Linux, or you can install it on other versions of Linux. But using your Cinea, the attacker 
might send out DTP frames and convince Switch 1 in this case that it's a Switch. Switch 1 says, I'm talking to another Switch. They just sent me a, a DTP advertisement. So we form a one q trunk over that Switch, which gives me access to, to VLAN 5. I'll just tag my VLAN with, or tag my frame with uh, VLAN 5. It goes over to Switch 1, sends it over to Switch 2. Switch 2 says, oh yeah, uh, I'll send this at my VLAN 5 ports. And we reach the victim. Another option is to do something called double tagging. So even if I'm not, uh, even if I'm not pretending to be a switch, maybe DTP is turned off on a particular port. For security, maybe we should. But we could do something, or the attacker could do something called double tagging if they know the native MAC address, uh, the native VLAN, I should say, between switch SW1 and switch SW2. Remember on a dot one q what a native VLAN is on a dot one q trunk. A native VLAN is the one VLAN that does not get tagged. Now, by default, it's VLAN 1. But for every other VLAN, there's going to be four tag bytes added to every frame. And there are, th uh, there are a few bits in those tag bytes that identify our VLAN membership. Except for the VLAN that we, uh, that we, uh, that we call our native VLAN. And again, by default, that's VLAN 1. So what if we did this? The attacker knows that the native VLAN between switch SW1 and SW2, uh, or they're making a guess that they left it at the default. We should probably change our native VLAN, but we're they might be assuming that uh, the default VLAN 1 is being used. So what they'll do is they'll take their frame and they'll tag it with VLAN 5. That's the destination. We want to go to VLAN 5, and uh, that's where the victim lives. But we'll put another tag on the outside that says VLAN 1. So here's what happens. This goes into switch SW1. It says, oh, I see you're, you're tagged with VLAN 1. You know, that's actually a native VLAN on this port going over to switch SW2. So let me take that off. We don't, we don't label VLAN 1 traffic. We don't, add those, uh, we don't add those four extra tag bytes. So now that exposes the VLAN 5 tag which does make it to the victim system. Now, in this case, unlike with switch spoofing, there's no return path. There's no way for the, if we, if we try to get information from the victim, double tagging is not going to do, do it for us. Double tagging can get us to that VLAN, but it's not going to allow return traffic to come back. So this might be used for a denial of service attack. If we're trying to flood that victim system, the victim belongs to VLAN 5. We don't have access to VLAN 5. The attacker could double tag their frames, perhaps, if they can correctly determine the native VLAN between a couple of switches, and uh, they can start flooding that victim with lots and lots of traffic. Another very, very common type of attack is a social engineering attack. This is where somebody uses basically social skills to get information to, uh, to get access to information they should not have access to. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my favorite, in fact, it is my favorite book talking about uh, hacking and uh, phone freaking it's uh, by Kevin Mitnick. Uh, I've got it on audio. I've listened to it, I don't know, maybe three times. It's called, uh, it's called Man in the Wires. Oh, no, or Ghost in the Wires. In fact, you know what? Let me look that up. I want to make sure I get that right. Yeah, I think it's Ghost in the Wires. Let me open this up really quick. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kevin Mitnick. I've got a few of, I've got a few of his books. Let's see, let me just go to Amazon really quick here. And let's say, I think it's Ghost in the Wires. Yeah, that's it, Ghost in the Wires. I would recommend that book if you wanna just hear some real life war stories, if you will, from, uh, he was known as uh, the world's number one most wanted hacker for a while. He's turned good now, he's got a cybersecurity company, but uh, yeah, some really cool stories in there. The reason I thought of him was, just a tremendous amount, a uh, tremendous number of the attacks that he was able to carry out were based on social engineering. He would have good social skills and convince somebody to let him act, give him physical access to a room that he shouldn't have access to, or just so much was uh, given out uh, through social engineering techniques. One type of social engineering attack we see a lot is phishing. You might have received an email that said something like, uh, you're this is your bank and uh, we're going to reset your password or maybe it's your media or your social media service. We're going to reset your password. You're going to log back in and they give you a link to go reset your password and you go to a page that looks like the bank's page, but it's really not. 
it's a page the attacker has, and they see you put in your old password, and suddenly they have your username and password information. That's phishing. We want to be very, very cautious about clicking on any links that come inside of an email. We should not be doing that. A physical, a way to get physical access to an environment might be through tailgating. Let's say that there's a secure door where people have to badge in maybe to get into a data center and uh, or maybe to get into a building. This is something that Kevin Mitnick would do uh, when he would get access to buildings. He would do something like this. You can pretend to be a secure uh, or delivery driver carrying a big box. You pretend it's really heavy and you see somebody going in. So you hop out of your car and you start carrying this box. You say, hey, buddy, can you hold the door for me? Uh, and they, humans, they're good people. A lot of people are good. And just trying to help is our nature. So that, oh, yeah, let me help. Uh, let me get that door for you. And they'll hold the door open while the malicious user walks in with this box containing nothing, really. But they've got use of the, uh, they've got access to the building. That's called piggybacking. Another way that we might do, or an attacker might do social engineering, is called uh, shoulder serving. Here, they're, le they're looking over the shoulder of somebody, entering a password or keying in the pin. Now, personally, I'm probably not, uh, I haven't practiced it for one thing, but if I'm looking at somebody typing in a password on the keyboard, I don't know what they typed, but some people that have practiced this, they are really, really good. They can watch you type something and eight characters, yeah, that they know what you type just by watching your fingers on the keyboard. So you might want to be very cautious about <laughs> who's around when you're entering password or, or PIN information, as an example. Another common type of attack is malware. Malware, it's it's different than a virus. Oftentimes, a, a virus will be infected with a virus, and it's going to maybe destroy things on our system. Malware could do that, or malware might be used for other purposes. I, I gave the... A malware example earlier when we were talking about a DDoS attack with a distributed denial of service attack, we said we maybe through uh, some sort of gaming app that people downloaded, we infected computers around the world with malware. Well, one feature of that malware in that example was the ability for somebody to come in through a back door from that command and control server and get access to these PCs or smartphones or, or wireless routers that live around the world because they've been infected with malware. An attacker might also do DNS poisoning. If they can convince us to go to their DNS server, which they can if they're able to send us information from their DHCP server, uh, we can do D, uh, DNS poisoning where they're trying to go to a popular social media site, but instead they're redirected to our site, which looks like that social media site, and we capture their password information. A type of malware that's really, really ugly is ransomware. A few years back, there was a really popular one on the news. It was called the, the WannaCry virus. Uh, WannaCry made you want to cry because it would literally hold your data for ransom. You would get this big red screen that said, the data on your computer has been encrypted. And it was. They weren't bluffing. They, they encrypted the data on your computer. And they said, if you, want to, uh, if you want to unlock your data, we'll give you the key, but you need to send us this much, this much Bitcoin. And... It got so bad, people were, people were losing their data. They went to law enforcement. Law enforcement's response got to the point where they said, our only option is to, is to pay it. We, we're not able to decrypt your data. Uh, if you want any chance of getting your data back, you're going to have to pay the ransom. Now, a percentage of the time, the people would pay the ransom. They'd get their key. Sometimes they paid the ransom. They still lost their data. They, they never, never got a key. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of having a malware scanners or ransomware scanners and virus scanners on our devices to better protect ourselves. Another type of attack is, a, and we saw this earlier, is a spoofing attack where an attacker claims to be coming from, a, uh, from an IP address that they're really not coming from. This is where we were launching that DOS attack earlier. The uh, attacker was claiming to be the victim's IP address when they sent that directed broadcast out. Uh, when they did a ping to the directed broadcast. Yeah, they were spoofing their IP address. We could, by the way, prevent that on our Cisco routers using a feature called reverse path forwarding, RPF. What RPF is going to do, it's going to make sure that uh, we're not coming from a, an IP address that should not be seen on a, on a particular router interface by taking a look at the source IP address of packets coming in in an interface and comparing that to the router's IP routing table. And the router says, if I were going to send traffic back to that IP address, which interface would I use? And it's, oh, I would use gig 0 slash 2. 
Well, if that IP address came in gigabit zero slash five, that's inconsistent with the IP routing table. And if we're running reverse path forwarding on the router, it's gonna block that traffic. Deauthentication is something we might use on a wireless access point. For example, uh, here's a, a Cisco wireless access point. And even though this is better with Wi-Fi 6, most access points are not running Wi-Fi 6. We're still running like .11 AC, which is Wi-Fi 5. But uh, let's say that I've got my, here's my smartphone. Let's see, I've got my smartphone connect, uh, authenticated with this wireless access point. Well, as an attacker, I can send deauthentication frames to this access point to knock that smartphone off. And it's going to try to re-authenticate. In fact, if you join us for our uh, certified ethical hacker training, I show you how to do that in uh, Kali Linux. I have Kali Linux send out a bunch of deauthentication frames to a wireless access point. It kicks my phone off when my phone tries, tries to reattach, uh, tries to reauthenticate. It goes through a, not a three-way, but a four-way handshake. I capture what's going on with that four-way handshake in, in the demo that I do in that, uh, I think it's called our professional ethical hacking course, uh, but it gets you ready for the certified ethical hacker exam. I take that information captured in that four-way handshake and I run a brute force attack against that, against a password list of like 14 million commonly used passwords. And sure enough, that was one of the commonly used passwords. I think in that, in that demo, I used my favorite uh, Star Wars Sith Lord, Darth Bane. If you've ever read the Darth Bane trilogy, really, really good reading there. But uh, Darth Bane was the password I used in that example. And wouldn't you know it, that was one of the commonly used passwords in that list that I used for my brute force attack. And within about 20 minutes, I was able to break into that access point. In that, uh, it was in an isolated lab, and it was my own equipment. I wasn't breaking into somebody else's network. I was uh, doing it for demonstration purposes only on my own equipment. But that's what we can do with deauthentication frames. And again, that gets better with Wi-Fi version 6, we'll be talking about later today. But also, some of the Cisco access points, even prior to IP version 6, they... Uh, they could prevent those deauthentication frames as well. And I mentioned that if we do get some data, we get a hashed string or an encrypted string, or we watch that four-way handshake with a wireless network, we might run a brute force attack against that captured data. Uh, MD5, for example, our hash that we talked about earlier, I could take a bunch of different commonly used passwords, run the MD5 hash on them, see if it matches that string that I have. And if it does, that's probably the password. So even though we cannot decrypt something that's hashed, we can run a brute force attack on a password list and see if that hash matches the hash that we have, that we're trying to decipher. That's a brute force attack. How do we defend ourselves against some of these th different threats out there? Just some best practices. A lot of these are common sense, but do we do them? As uh, Brenda Bouchard says, common sense is not always common practice. We have things like our IDS, our IPS sensors, and I mentioned that they have a signature database. We need to keep that signature database up to date. So let's make sure we do good signature management. There's also a collection of best practices to harden a device like turn this on, turn this off. Uh, Cisco has a macro that you can use on some Cisco routers. Do this in a non-production network when you're first experimenting with it. But you can go into global configuration, or not, not even global configuration mode. You can just say, you can say auto secure. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to walk you through a wizard that's going to allow you to apply a bunch of best practice security recommendations to a Cisco router. We should also probably change the native VLAN. I showed you a VLAN hopping attack, attack earlier that was predicated on the attacker knowing the, uh, the, the native VLAN that was being used on a .1Q trunk. We should probably change that to something other than one. Maybe change it to 20 as an example. And something else we, we should do is not give users too much access to things they might not need access to. In other words, we want to define the privileges given out to different user accounts. And when we're talking about users, we might want to send users, if we're sending them, if they're downloading a file, instead of just downloading that file, we might want to also send them a hash digest, or we might use HMAC to say, you should be able to calculate this same hash digest by running it on this file to make sure that file integrity has not been compromised. Somebody's not modified that file in transit. And when we're setting up users, let's give them different roles. Let's not give them more permission than they need. Uh, than they need. We could also protect our networks by installing 
distractions. We can install a server called a Honey Pot. And a Honey Pot is a server that's very weakly protected. So if an attacker is trying to scan our network looking for any weaknesses, they're likely to come up on this Honey Pot to say, oh, they've got these ports open. They're not, they don't have this update, uh, this patch applied to their operating system. And the attacker breaks into that Honey Pot system. Well, once they're in there exploring around, we have data that might look like it's important, but it's really not. It's not secure data. It's a distraction. While they're in there, number one, we can see what sort of tools the attacker is using to get into our network so we can better defend against those, those approaches. And also, we're just wasting their time. They're spending all their time looking through a meaningless system while we're watching them. And on a larger scale, you can have an entire network that's a distraction, and that's called a honey net. And something we mentioned earlier, pen testing. It might be worth having somebody internal or somebody external do a penetration test on our network to define any weaknesses or identify any weaknesses. And I gave the university example earlier of segmenting our network up into different security zones. Yeah, maybe uh, in the university example, we want to protect students from the bad people on the internet, but we want to protect our faculty and staff from students who get curious and uh, try to get in and maybe change their grade is the classic thing you see in the, in the movies. Some other ways that we might defend against uh, these attacks is to use what I talked about earlier. Cisco calls it defense in depth. I gave the metaphor of a, a blanket on a, a bunch of blankets on a cold winter's night. We don't just install a firewall. We don't just install an IPS sensor. We don't just install malware detection uh, software. We do it all. We have overlapping layers of security. We want security in or defense in depth. And when we add it, we're talking about users again. When we add a user, we probably don't want to say, well, a, a user is going to have this default set of permissions. They can get to some things, but we'll have to give them extra permissions to get to other things. A lot of people in high security environments recommend using something called zero trust. When you add a new user by default, they don't have used to a they don't have access to a default set of resources. They have access to zero resources. We don't trust them at all until we explicitly give them permission. And let's say that a user belongs to two different groups. This group is not allowed to get to this one server. This other gr group is allowed to get to this one server. If we use the least privilege approach, the, the group that's most restrictive, that's going to be the rule that's enforced. So even though the user belongs to these two groups and one group says, yes, you can get to the server with least privilege, we're not going to be able to get to the server because the user also belongs to a group that should not have access to that server. We also want to be able to authenticate our users and prove they are who they claim to be. And you can set up a, a database on a router, for example, or a switch where somebody's going to have to give a username and password to log into that switch, but that's not very scalable. Uh, and if we had this on, let's say, 20 routers and we had somebody leave our networking department, uh, maybe we fired them, they know the password to our routers. We're going to have to go around and change it on all the routers. That's not scalable. So what we can do instead is use AAA. Now, AAA, that's an acronym standing for authentication, authorization, and accounting. Authentication is us proving we are who we claim to be, like giving credentials. Authorization is asking what are we allowed to do once we get authenticated. And accounting is kind of keeping an audit trail. It's saying, what did you do once you got logged in? This reminds me when I went to work at uh, Walt Disney World. At Walt Disney World, they have they had over 600 six, uh, Cisco routers and thousands of Cisco Catalyst switches. Well, they didn't want to give me a password, the enable secret password to 600 plus routers. What they did instead is they gave me an account on AAA server. I had a username and a password, and I was given authorization to access the routers once I got logged in. Then when I ended up leaving Disney, they didn't have to go reset the password on uh, on uh, 600 routers. They just deleted my account. It's a lot more scalable in an enterprise environment. And there are two basic types of uh, AAA servers that you might run into, TACX Plus servers and RADIUS servers. And on some exams, you might want to know the difference between these. First of all, TACX Plus, the, the plus means it's a, it's a Cisco proprietary implementation of the industry standard TACX. RADIUS, that is an industry standard. It's interesting that TACX Plus is based on TCP, while RADIUS is based on UDP, and UDP is connectionless. If we drop a packet, it's not going to be retransmitted, something to keep in mind there. And with TACX Plus, 
the authentication, authorization, and accounting, they're treated as, as separate entities, separate workers doing those three separate jobs. With Radius, it's kind of all lumped together in one big thing. And with, uh, with TACX Plus, the server does not just authenticate the user, the user authenticates the server, so we know we're not talking to a rogue server. With Radius, it's only one-way authentication. So I'm making a case that TACX is, is better in a lot of cases, but there's still plenty of times when I'm going to be using Radius. Radius is often used in wireless networks to authenticate. Something else, TACX is going to encrypt the entire packet, but Radius only encrypts the password that's being sent when we're giving our credentials. And user authentication might be multi-factor authentication. With multi-factor authentication, it's more than just knowing a password. That would be single-factor authentication. It might be something we know, like a password, but it might be also something that we have, like some sort of a, a badge or a key card, or some sort of smart card. Maybe what a user is, biometric scanners. Or maybe it's where a user is based on geolocation. We can have geofencing or what they do. Uh, let me give an example. With my, with my smartphone, maybe I have to know a PIN to get into my phone. Or if I'm trying to go to, uh, if I'm trying to go to, let's say a bank, for example, or some other, some other online account, and I've got multi-factor authentication set up on that account. In addition, in addition to knowing a password, I might have to give some sort of a code. I have, uh, I have the Google Authenticator app on my phone, and the Google Authenticator app comes up with a, I think it's a six-digit string for these different sites that I have passwords on. And if I try to attach to one of these sites, in addition to giving a correct password, I've got just a few seconds to put in the six-digit code that my authenticator app says that I'm that I need to use. So in other words, I have to have a phone with that app. So that's what a user has. What a user is, I can do facial ID. I can look at this and it's going to scan my the LiDAR sensor, it's going to scan my face, and that's who I am. Or on my laptop, I've got a fingerprint scanner. Where a user is, yeah, I've got GPS on my phone. Uh, it could, I don't think I have a system like this right now that I'm using, but we could restrict people to only using a service. Well, I I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, not too long ago, uh, last month in August, yeah, in August, that was last month, my family and I, we went on a Disney cruise. I told you we're big Disney fans. And uh, we went on the new ship, The Wish, well, when you're getting on uh, when you're getting on the wish, once you're there, you're able to get access to resources that you wouldn't have access to off uh, off of the ship. So when you go to the app, it says, "Oh, we see you're on board," or "We see you're not on board." Uh, basically, in that case, it's not so much geolocation; it's more getting on their Wi-Fi network. But as an example, uh, one of the things that's hard to get on the wish is access to their Star Wars lounge. It's called the Hyperspace Lounge, and uh, reservations go really really quick. So as, as soon as we got through security and we got into the terminal, I, as soon as we're geolocated next to the ship, I'm able to get on their access point and I'm able to make our, uh, we're able to make reservations for the whole family to go into the hyperspace lounge, which is really cool, by the way. Check out their $5,000 kyber crystal drink. That's a whole nother story. But uh, yeah, it could be, you only have access to certain resources based on where you're located or maybe what a user does. On, on some devices, you have to give, like, draw a star or make some sort of pattern with your finger, maybe on a keypad or on a touch screen uh, to, uh, to prove you are who you claim to be. And one security acronym or, or standard you'll hear a lot about is 802.1x. This, uh, this is used a lot with wireless networks in, in enterprises. It can also be used with wired networks. Basically, a user is having to authenticate before they get access to a network. So we could set this up on a switch or we can set this up on a wireless access point. Network access control takes it a bit further. It check, it does what's called posture validation. It checks the, uh, the PC or the phone. It checks the device to make sure that, for example, its operating system has a certain patch applied or the, or the antivirus software is running a certain version. We make sure that, that, the, that the device that's about to be introduced to our network has a sufficient level of protection. And... If they do, they're allowed on the network. If they don't, they're not going to be allowed on the network. We might filter MAC addresses. So somebody brings in a rogue machine, we don't let them get on our network. Or maybe we have a captive portal. This is, um, this is what you oftentimes see in a, uh, in a hotel or maybe on a plane. If I'm flying uh, Delta, they have, their, uh, they have their 
the Delta Wi-Fi that you connect to. So you get on the Wi-Fi on the plane, and when you try to go to a website, not so fast. You have to go to their captive captive portal. They redirect you to one of their pages where you can pay for access to the internet. Or in a hotel, you might get a page that says, give me your last name and your room number. If that matches their database, then you're allowed to get uh, you're allowed to get on the network. Besides AAA, another security server type that we have out there is called Kerberos, or some people pronounce that Cerberus. It's named after the multi-headed dog that belongs to Hades that stands guard uh, at uh, at the gates of Hades. But it's uh, it, it's actually a little bit more complicated than AAA. You have to have a ticket to be able to try to authenticate with the files or to be able to get access to the file server. Metaphorically, you're saying, I have a ticket to access you. Well, to get that ticket, you have to first authenticate yourself. So first we authenticate with an authentication server giving whatever credentials we're using. Assuming we're authenticated, we're then given permission to talk to the ticket granting server. And if the ticket then or the ticket granting server gives us a ticket, we can then take that ticket and uh, go talk to our file server. And we say, we got a ticket, we're allowed to talk to you. And in some cases, this is gonna use those public uh, certificates or those uh, digital certificates we were talking about earlier with the public and private key pairs. Uh, it's gonna make it a little bit more scalable. And when we're talking about users signing on, back in the day, years ago, we would have one database, I remember, for email users. There will be another database for getting on servers or, or file sharing on a network. There might be another database for some other act, uh, some other service on the network. That's hard to keep up with. We've got multiple user databases for the same user, and if they change their password on one, it's now not going to match on the other systems. To get around that, a lot of people are using single sign-on. Well, single sign-on, we can use an LDAP server. That stands for a lightweight directory access protocol. And that can be a single repository on our network for getting access to everything, email, file servers, whatever it is. Getting access to VPN services, we have to authenticate just one time to that LDAP server. And I've asked my students over the years what LDAP server they're using. And I would say well over 90% of my students have told me that they're using Microsoft Active Directory for their LDAP server. By the way, I've got a video on YouTube if, if you'd like to see how to set up for free, just in a test environment, uh, Microsoft Active Directory. You can just search, I think, Kevin Wallace Active Directory, and it should show up if you want to see how that is set up. And IP phones, I said I do a lot in the collaboration world. Yeah, IP phones, they can use those LDAP servers too. And that's a look at some common network attacks and common defenses to protect against those attacks. Here in module number four, we want to talk about some different aspects of how we can better secure these things. There are wireless access points. So when we communicate from, let's see, here's my, here's a wireless tablet. If I'm communicating and somebody were to intercept that communication, we want to make sure they're not able to read it. We've got basically the same sort of goals that we had as we talked about earlier. We want things to be confidential. We don't want somebody to gain access to a wireless network if they should not have access to that wireless network. And that's going to be our focus. First, let's consider some different threats that we might have in the wireless environment. One is where somebody comes into an environment and they turn on the radio in their laptop, for example, and they just start scanning the airwaves to see what's out there. This is sometimes called passive footprinting. They're not actively sending any traffic out and trying to do malicious things. They're just sitting back and watching and listening and understanding the terrain of the wireless network. What are the access points? What are the MAC addresses or the BSSIDs of the different access points? What channels are being used? And by get, gathering that footprinting information, they might formulate an attack that they want to launch. They could also do active footprinting. This is where they're still trying to get a lay of the land, if you will, but they're proactively sending traffic to an access point and getting replies from that access point to try to speed things up a little bit. We might also have an attacker that uh, spoofs their MAC address. Maybe we have wireless security set up that specific MAC addresses can get on the network and other MAC addresses cannot get on the network. Well, the attacker might set things up such that they're lying about their IP address. Earlier today, we talked about spoofing an IP address. Well, they could be spoofing their MAC address. And if they see that a user is going to an access point and they sniff that traffic, they say, oh, this user has this MAC address on their wireless network card. Well, I'm gonna say that I have that MAC address now. I saw the user had the old A's MAC address. 
I'm going to say I have the always MAC address. And then if we're using MAC address based security, the attacker is going to be able to get on the network. Something else they might do is to in insert their own rogue access point. They might hide it behind a, a desk or something where it's not obvious, but they get, or maybe a wiring closet, but they get connectivity into the corporate network and then they can go somewhere else unnoticed and get access to that wired network. Maybe they're in their car out in the parking lot, but they put that access point up on the second floor and they can still reach that from their car. Yeah, they've inserted a rogue access point, giving them another way in to try to, to do dastardly things on the network. Uh, they might insert a wireless access point and have that wireless access point claim that its SSID is the same as the corporate SSID. That way, when somebody goes to join the network and they see that they're trying to join the network of XYZ Corp, well, they might, uh, they might say, oh, yeah, there's my network. I'm going to join that. And a percentage of the time, they're going to be connecting to this evil twin that's advertising the very same SSID as the legitimate corporate network. So what we might do or what an attacker might do is to send de-authentication frames to that access point to knock off legitimate users, forcing them to re-authenticate and retry to get back on the network. And a percentage of the time, you guessed it, they're going to be connecting not to the actual corporate access point. They're going to be connecting to our evil twin and become associated with that, where the attacker can then capture those frames. <clears throat> We talked earlier about uh, de-authentication, where we could also capture that four-way handshake. That's another de-authentication threat. And we could run a brute force attack against that four-way handshake and determine what the password is for a user. They might also try to hijack an existing session. Session hijacking is going to be where somebody is already authenticated with an access point. They've already provided their username and password credentials or whatever they're providing. And since they're already at that point, the attacker might just hijack that existing session instead of trying to figure out what the password is on their own. And one thing that we can do is better protect and better secure our access points. We don't want to be using default passwords. We don't want to say Linksys Linksys, for example, in our, in our home router as the username password combination. We want to use strong security standards, strong passwords. We'll be talking about those in this module. But in addition to wireless hacking in the Wi-Fi context, we also have Bluetooth hacking. I showed you earlier this uh, little Ubertooth One adapter. This is something that lets me communicate from my PC uh, using Bluetooth. And in that uh, professional ethical hacking course I was telling you about, I actually do a demonstration where I have this plugged into a machine running Kali Linux, and I'm sniffing the Bluetooth environment around me. And uh, to my surprise, it picked up my uh, my my Ember coffee mug. I've got a coffee mug in my kitchen that uh, can be controlled with an app where it keeps the temperature at a certain level. And I was able to detect that showing up on Bluetooth. So Bluetooth hacking, there are a few different, a few different flavors of Bluetooth hacking and we'll talk about some of those. But Bluetooth overall uses the 2.4 gig band and it's typically a one-to-one -one communication where one device, like uh, my gaming controller, is talking to another device, like my gaming console. Or maybe my phone is talking, and my car is talking to my car's audio system using a Bluetooth connection. Examples of Bluetooth devices include things like your mobile phone, or here's, here I have my Apple AirPods Pro that I put in my ear when I'm exercising and they connect to my exercise equipment via Bluetooth. We mentioned gaming consoles. We've got uh, speakers. I've got some outside speakers and yeah, we use Bluetooth for that. And I've noticed that if I, I have those outside speakers, they're out by our pool area. If I put my phone too far away, like on the other side of the pool or put it uh, underneath a bunch of stuff that blocks that Bluetooth signal, Bluetooth signal doesn't go all that far. And uh, yeah, it starts breaking up the audio when I do that. Most of the security concerns, the good news is, is usually with older Bluetooth devices where we could do some things that maybe we, we shouldn't be doing. But um, let's take a look at some of the threats we might have have with Bluetooth. Uh, and by the way, the range isn't all that far. It's typically about 30 feet, uh, about, uh, about 10 meters or so. But one type of Bluetooth hacking <clears throat> is called blue, uh, blue jacking. And with blue jacking, the attacker is sending information to a device. For example, I want to insert maybe a new contact card in somebody's contact list. 
well, that would be an example of blue jacking. Uh, blue snarfing, that's where, that's where we're learning information about a device. We're sort of doing some reconnaissance on that device and gathering information about that device. We could also launch a denial of service attack on that device with, uh, with blue smacking. Blue bugging, as the name suggests, allows us to eavesdrop in, maybe on a phone conversation. And uh, blue printing is sort of a passive surveying. We're just sort of getting a blueprint of the uh, Bluetooth landscape. <laughs> blueprint, Bluetooth, no, no pun intended there. But I'm just learning what's out there with uh, blue printing. But those are some of the things where uh, we can inject data on a device like a phone with uh, blue jacking, gather information about that device with blue snarfing, uh, blue smacking, launch a denial of service tech, blue bugging, eavesdrop in, blue printing, just sort of survey the environment. Now, let's talk about how we can defend against different types of wireless attacks. And getting back to our Wi-Fi discussion, let's say that we've got the goal of not wanting somebody to eavesdrop in on our data, or we don't want them to gain access to the network if they should not have access to the network. And let's say I've got this access point in my building. Would you, let me ask you this, would you ever put an ethernet port on the outside of your building and let somebody drive up in their car and maybe plug into that ethernet jack? No, that, I would not be secure with it. But that's essentially what we're doing if we have a weakly secured and poorly placed access point where the signal might extend out into the parking lot. Somebody could drive up and they could get access to, to the corporate network. To prevent that, we might want to reposition the access point. We might want to reduce its power level so the coverage area doesn't have as, as big of a radius. But we want to make sure that somebody's going to have to authenticate themselves before they can gain access to the network, more than just having access to the signal. And once we're transmitting data on the network, if somebody were to eavesdrop in and capture that data, we don't want them to be able to do anything with that. So we want to encrypt it, much like we talked about earlier. And there are several different wireless security standards out there. Let's go back to the original one. Uh, the original security standard for, uh, for wireless networks back, at, uh, back in the original 802.11 specification was something called WEP. That stands for Wired Equivalent Privacy. Now, the name is a bit misleading, I think. Wired Equivalent Privacy, to me, sounds like we're saying, this is equivalent to being on a wired network. That's the level of privacy you get. Poppycock! It is not anywhere near the level of privacy you get on a wired network. In fact, this is a very, very weak security standard. It uses the RC4 encryption algorithm, and that stands for RONS Code 4. And the issue isn't with RONS Code 4, it's the issue with how it's implemented. You see, RC4 is going to take the string of data that we're trying to secure, it's going to take our pre-shared key, and it's going to take something called an initialization vector, an IV. And it's going to mathematically mush all that stuff together. Again, the string we're trying to encrypt, the pre-shared key, and the initialization vector. And the problem with RC4 is it uses a very short initialization vector. It's only 24 bits long. And that might sound like a lot, but um, you can, in an environment with a decent amount of traffic on a web network, if you capture traffic for about eight minutes, there are utilities out on the internet that can uh, take those captured packets and determine what the pre-shared key is in about eight minutes. That is just that just blows my mind. Now that was with a pre-shared key. Remember earlier we talked about having a symmetric key. That's kind of what a pre-shared key is. We go to the client, we go to the access point, and we give them both the same key. So if you want to add a new device to your wireless network, somebody gets a new phone, you put in the pre-shared key that everybody uses, and that pre-shared key is going to be used with whatever encryption algorithm we use to encrypt the data. Again, this is not going to scale very well. If we had an enterprise environment with hundreds or maybe thousands of users, we don't want to give everybody the pre-shared key. That could, uh, that could get lost or somebody might give that away. That's not a good thing. So in a large environment, we want to use not the pre-shared key or personal mode. We want to use something called enterprise mode. Here, we have an authentication server, like typically a radius server. We talked about radius earlier. And this is really 802.1x that we mentioned. 802.1x, which we could use with a switch or we could use with an access point, it's got really three roles that are played here. One role is that of the device trying to get access to the network. That's called a supplicate. To supplicate is to ask for something. 
So the supplicant is asking permission to get on the network. The authenticator, and I think that name is a little bit misleading as well. That's the switch, or in this case, the access point. The authenticator is just sort of the relay that's taking these messages coming from the supplicant, and it relays them over to our radius server. And the radius server, that's our authentication server. So the supplicant tells the authenticator, I'd really like to join the network. The authenticator sends that over to the radius server, and uh, the radius server, if we've provided the appropriate credentials, the radius server is going to create a key just for me and just for that session. And it's going to give a copy of that key to the authenticator, the access point, and to me, the client. And for the duration of that session, the client and the access point, they're going to be using that symmetric key pair to encrypt their data. But again, we don't want to use RC4 with 24-bit initialization vectors. That's going to be very weak. Well, an improvement to that is TKIP. That stands for Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. This got popular after WEP was determined to be just so incredibly weak. With TKIP, we're still using RC4, but don't be discouraged. We're using, we're using a better version of RC4, making it much more secure than, than WEP. Specifically, we're using a 48-bit initialization vector. Now, you might say, well, we went from 24 to 48. Does that mean we're twice as secure now? It's going to take 16 minutes instead of 8 to break into the network? Not at all. You see, when we go from 24 bits to 25 bits, that doubles the security. We go to 26 bits, that doubles it again. So if we go from 24 to 48 bits, we are orders of magnitude more secure than we were before. And TKIP does not require a great deal of processing on the, on the part of the wireless network card. So it was a great compromise for older devices that didn't have a lot of horsepower on their wireless interface card while still giving us better security than WEP. But remember we mentioned AES earlier? I said that's really the flagship encryption algorithm that we want to be using today. Yeah, it's better if we use AES. That's going to be better than TKIP and just insanely better than, uh, than WEP was. But AES does take some extra horsepower. It takes some extra processor cycles for the clients or the access points or any wireless device to, to process that encryption. So when you're setting up your access point, you may be presented with a set of security standards, WPA, WPA2, and WPA3. Now, WPA, that stands for Wi-Fi Protected Access. In the original w, uh, WPA, it did use TKIP. That was good in that it supported some older devices that didn't have a lot of processing power, but it was better than WEP. So we got to preserve our investment in existing hardware. And remember, TKIP uses that better initialization vector, 48 bits as opposed to 24 bits. But still, it's TKIP. It's still weaker, far weaker than AES. So Wi-Fi uh, or Wi-Fi protected access or WPA2 came out. And for over for about a decade or so, that was the end-all, be-all of wireless security standards. You're setting up an access point, you better use WPA2. In fact, the Wi-Fi Alliance that allows vendors to put the Wi-Fi sticker on their device, in 2006, they said it's a requirement if you're going to uh, if you're going to be certified with the Wi-Fi Alliance, your WPA2 must uh, or your device must support WPA2. So they're pretty serious about this. And a requirement for WPA2 was that it had to support AES, that better encryption standard. But notice the wording here. It had to support AES. It didn't necessarily mean we had to run AES. And this could vary depending on our hardware, the vendor. But in some cases, you could be running WPA2, but you said, I've got all these old devices. I don't want to have to have to run AES. My devices can't, cannot handle it. Well, on some systems, you could tell WPA2 not to use AES, even though it could support it, and use TKIP instead. Or you could say, just use AES. Or you could say, use either one. Let the client decide which one we're going to be using. But AES, it does require more processing power than WPA. But, but over the years, I mean, this has been out for a while. Over the years, more people get more and more modern hardware with better processing. And for, like I said, a decade, this was the go-to wireless security standard out there until... 2016 happened. In 2016, there was a vulnerability discovered with WPA2. It was called the crack vulnerability. So yeah, now we have WPA3 is what is going to be preferred. This is going to use just AES, no TKIP, 
And if we're in personal mode, we're using 128-bit AES keys. But if we're in enterprise mode with the radius server and .1x, we have 192-bit keys. So we get even more secure with AES. And remember, we talked about those deauthentication frames that we might send or an attacker might send to knock somebody off of an access point. We're protected against that with uh, WPA3. And uh, we also are going to be more secure on uh, publicly available networks. Like you go to the airport or a coffee shop and you're on a public Wi-Fi. Yeah, instead of somebody just eavesdropping in, you're going to be better protected with WPA3. And also, there used to be a button on the back of a lot of these, uh, these home wireless access points that you might get from your big box store. It was labeled uh, WPS. You would press that WPS button, and that was a way to easily go add another device to the network without having to key in a bunch of password information. Well, there was a weakness in that as well. So that, I don't want to say, uh, I want to say automated setup, but an assisted setup. I guess that's a better way of saying it. There was a different assisted setup process that was introduced with WPA3 that replaced WPS, and it's called DPP, Device Provisioning Protocol. Something else we could do is have a separate guest network for people that come into our organization and they don't have permission to be on the corporate network. We're isolating them to their own guest network. Or we might not want one guest to see what another guest is doing. So we can even give some additional protection for those guests by by isolating individual wireless clients in that guest network. So one guest client cannot eavesdrop in on another guest client. We might also do MAC address filtering. Now this is not super strong, but it's a layer. Remember the blankets on the cold winter's night? It's a layer of security. We might have a MAC address filter that says in order for a wireless device to attach to this access point, it has to match one of the MAC addresses in this list. And if it doesn't, hold up a big stop sign and say, no, thou shall not pass. And we're gonna drop that traffic. Again, it's not super secure because we can fairly easy, easily falsify what MAC address that we're using. We also talked about uh, being authenticated based on where we are. We mentioned the term geofencing. That's what we could do uh, maybe in an environment that has a bunch of different a bunch of different vendors, like in a shopping mall, we've got all these different stores and maybe you're going to be given a coupon based on your proximity to a store. This has happened to me. I've been like in a, in a big shopping area and I'll get a pop-up message saying that uh, some sort of discount coupon on this store that I happen to be standing in front of right then. So maybe based on our geographic location, we can or cannot get access to certain things or before we can... Uh, I think I mentioned the example of checking in on a cruise ship. I had to be in close proximity with that cruise ship in order to be able to, to get on their to be able to get on their network. Oh, we also talked about a captive portal. You might see that. I gave the example on uh, Delta Airlines and getting on their Wi-Fi or in a hotel. You might be asked to give your your account name, your your actual name, and your your password or your room number as an example. Now, something else, uh, just another collection of best practices that we can use to better protect ourselves. Let's not use the default wireless network names that come with our that come with our access points, such as Linksys used to be the one. I think they've changed it since then. But you would go down and you buy a router from a big box store, and it was Linksys, and the password was Linksys, or admin admin, or manager manager, or something like that. And, and that, those were well known. So it was very easy for people to get into equipment that had those default credentials. So let's change up the default wireless network names, the SSIDs. Let's change up the default username and passwords. In fact, again, this is not a high level of security, but it's a layer. We might disable our SSID broadcasts. We might not even announce that this network is available. Now, say it's not a super high level of security because somebody, an attacker that's knowledgeable, they would be able to sniff the airwaves and they would still be able to see that SSID even if it was not being broadcast. And we talked about earlier how an attacker might introduce a rogue access point into the network. Well, there are, there are scanners that a lot of the major enterprise level, wire, uh, wireless uh, enterprise level vendors have that will scan the network. Cisco does this. Uh, that can detect wireless ex or rogue wireless access points so you can locate and, and disable those. And you might want to, as part of that, you might want to make sure 
that you don't have any access points that have a vendor code that's different than the vendor you're using. If somebody inserts uh, vendor X's access point into the network, that might be one way that we're scanning for rogue access points. We're scanning the first half of the MAC address, the vendor code, to make sure we don't have some strange vendor's access point in our network. And let's use strong encryption, strong authentication, at least WPA2, preferably WPA3 if we can. Other things we can do, we could use wireless intrusion prevention system sensors. That's right. Uh, what this might do is it could detect those evil twins where somebody is uh, advertising the same network as the corporate network. It's going to try to detect somebody doing a wireless denial of service or a main in the middle or an on path attack. It can collect and analyze data, gives, give us a lot of analytics. Some examples of wireless IPS systems include Aruba's RF Protect Wireless IPS, and Cisco has one called the Cisco Adaptive Wireless APS, or excuse me, IPS. And that's a high level overview of some things we can do to better secure our wireless networks. Now, up next, I want to talk about session hijacking, and I've hinted at this a couple of times already. With session hijacking, we're, the attacker is letting the user go ahead and authenticate with whatever the target system is. So once they uh, so once we've bypassed that authentication stage, the attacker just takes over that existing session. They don't have to authenticate because the user already did that, and we just hijacked their session. Now, that's an, uh, that's an active attack where we're going to take over uh, a session from a user, or we might do a passive attack. Here, we're monitoring traffic in a session, but we're not really interrupting the flow, but we've still hijacked the session. We're, we're making the session flow through us as the attacker, and we're monitoring it, even though we're not raising any red flags, we're not disturbing anything. So active and passive. So after the session is established, there is oftentimes a, a, a session ID that identifies the session. And in some cases, it depends on the implementation. But in some cases, if the attacker knows the session ID, they can join that session. They say, here's my session ID, let me in. And they get to be part of that session because they have, uh, they've, they've learned that session ID. So after the authentication happens, the attacker joins the network. They figure out the session ID. And we'll talk about ways of figuring out the session ID. And then they can be part of the session and they can establish a new session using that session ID. There is application level session hijacking. And at the application level, this is often uh, web attacks using HTTP or HTTPS. And this is typically going to use those session IDs we talked about. There's also network level hijacking. Here, we're more concerned with uh, TCP and UDP, things down at the, at the transport and uh, network levels. And this is usually going to involve intercepting packets, not just finding out a session ID. Now, when I say session ID, I'm talking about something that's going to uniquely identify a, a session. So it's going to be used for TCP because that's a, a connection-oriented protocol. It's not going to be used for UDP, which is connectionless. And it's usually going to be this big, long string of semi, seemingly random alphanumeric characters. So let's think about how does the attacker get a session ID and inject themselves in that session? So they can launch something like a, a man in the middle attack where the traffic starts flowing through the attacker on the way from the user to the server. Well, one thing is they could use a man in the browser attack. A man in the browser attack is where there's some sort of a Trojan horse that's added to the browser software on the user's system. And then when they try to, let's say, use that browser and go to their bank, that Trojan horse software is going to redirect that down to the attacker. Uh, they go to that website and maybe they want to transfer $1,000 from their checking account to their savings account, but that Trojan horse in the browser software forces the traffic through the attacker's machine and the attacker says, let me change that up a little bit. Let's transfer $5,000 from your account to my account. And uh, then they can send the confirmation back to the user saying everything's good and dandy, when in reality, they just lost $5,000 and it's been transferred to the attacker. Sometimes session IDs are handed out in a somewhat predictable manner and an attacker might be able to guess what session ID that you're gonna be using. 
If they sniff multiple sessions, they might be able to run some, uh, some algorithms to determine or to estimate, what do you think the next one's gonna be? Let's see how you do on this one. Let's say the first session ID is ABC102. The next session ID is ABC104. And the next session ID is ABC108. Given that information, would you be able to guess the next session ID? Go ahead and chat it in. What do you think it might be? Uh, obviously, I'm not being terribly secure here. This uh, secure here. This is just a, a simple example. Yeah, a lot of people saying uh, ABC one sixteen. I agree, because you'll notice that that rightmost number, it's getting doubled each time. So two doubled is four. Four doubled is eight. Eight doubled, yeah, that's going to be 16. That might be the next session key. They might also, the attacker might also sniff the, the packets in a session that gets established that has all the right information in it. And then they come back later and uh, using those packets that they capture, they're able to, uh, using the session ID found in those captured packets, they're able to use that same session key as if the session were still going on assuming the user has walked away from their computer. We still got their session ID, the session's still active on, from the perspective of the server, the attacker just kind of takes it over. Now, session fixation. Here, the attacker is going to initiate the connection with the server. They say, I'd like to set up a secure session. And uh, the server says, all right, here's the session ID that we're gonna be using, but not so fast, you're still gonna have to authenticate yourself. So the attacker says, okay, I'll get back with you. And the attacker takes the session ID that it just got from the server, and then it's gonna send a link, maybe in an email, maybe a text or something to the user saying, you need to reset your password, go to this link. And that link connects the user with the server using the session ID provided by the attacker. So once the user authenticates with the server using that session ID, you guessed it, the attacker is now authenticated with the server because they already, they had the session ID initially, so they get access to the server. Cross-site scripting you may have heard of. This is where a user is going to have a, a link that they click on that maybe comes in an email. And this is going to be a malicious link that causes a valid session ID that the user is using. It's going to send that session ID down to the attacker. And the attacker again can use that session ID to talk to the server. That's similar to cross-site request forgery. Here, instead of getting a, an email with uh, some sort of malicious code in it, there's gonna be some malicious code installed on a site that the user connects to. And when they click on a link on the site, similar, similar to the cross-site scripting, it's gonna cause the, uh, the user to send that session, IK, uh, session key uh, to, uh, to a website that's controlled by the attacker. Actually, I said that backwards, I got ahead of myself, excuse me. We're, uh, the, uh, we get the uh, we get the user to authentic or we get the user to visit the attacker's website and the malicious code on that website. That's what extracts the session ID. I said that backwards. Pardon me. And that's going to be given to the attacker then, and then the attacker can use that session ID to communicate with the server. Next, let's consider network level hijacking. Network level hijacking is hijacking TCP and IP sessions. We can do a reset. We can uh, be dealing with encrypted traffic that we cannot even interpret, but we can hijack it anyway. It's called blind hijacking. And UDP hijacking is almost a misnomer because UDP is connectionless. We're not really setting up a session, but we can still do something called UDP hijacking. We'll talk about it in just a moment. But here with TCP hijacking, you remember the whole back and forth, uh, the SYN, the SYNAC, and the ACK is the through a handshake. Well, in addition to that, there's an initial, uh, an initial sequence number that's given, an ISN, and uh, that's sent back with the SYNAC. And the user responds with that number plus one. Well, if the attacker is monitoring that, that traffic going back and forth, when it gets that ISN sent from the server, if they're quick on their feet, the attacker is gonna be able to respond to the server before the user does. And they're gonna get that session set up rather than the legitimate user. Uh, a reset is where the uh, user is going to uh, force the user to uh, will send, send a reset command telling the user they need to re-authenticate 
And when they re-authenticate, the attacker is using the spoofed ID of the server. So the user sending that username password combination to the attacker, which then uses it to get on the server. Blind hijacking is where we're able to inject traffic going between a user and a server that's encrypted. It's called blind because it's encrypted. We cannot read it, but we can still mess with it. We can still, or the attacker can still alter the data by injecting traffic going to the server. We also mentioned uh, UDP hijacking. Oh yeah, I've got an animation here showing that the encrypted traffic could still flow through the attacker. Even though the attacker's not reading it, they could mess with it and they could add some additional traffic. Now, UDP hijacking, that term bothers me a little bit. We're not really hijacking a session because there is no such thing as a UDP session. However, we've got protocols that use UDP, like DNS. UDP hijacking means that we're gonna to respond to something using UDP faster than the legitimate user does. So let's say that the, um, or faster than the server does. Let's say that the user does a DNS query uh, and the attacker sees that query looking up a certain web website and it responds with a false IP address for that uh, fully qualified domain name. It responds with the DNS uh, IP address faster than the DNS server does. That's a way that the attacker can redirect the user to their own malicious server that looks like the bank's server, but really we're, we have one set up to, to copycat the bank server so we can capture username password combination. How do we protect against this? This sounds pretty uh, pretty serious. Well, one big thing is user training. Training your users. Do not click on anything in uh, in email from unknown sources and sometimes even from known sources. If it's your bank, don't click on the link in the email. Open up a browser and go directly to your bank's website. You want to keep your software up to date, all of your security software. You want to clear out your, your browser history periodically. And don't visit untrusted websites. Certainly don't click on links that come in texts or emails. We also might want to use secure session IDs where an attacker cannot look at a bunch of session IDs and then say, well, the next one's probably going to be this times two. No, let's use encrypted session IDs. Let's use session IDs that are not valid for the entire session. We get, uh, Depending on your system, sometimes you can use session keys that expire after a certain amount of time, or you might have you might require periodic re-logins, like things time out. I go to my doctor's office, for example, and uh, they log in, they check my records. We sit there and talk for a moment. They go to make an update on my records. They're logged out. Yeah, you might require repeated logins after a certain amount of time. And we want our session IDs to be randomized as much as possible so they're gonna be, they're gonna be harder to predict. Other things we can do is to use secure web servers like HTTPS instead of HTTP. It might be best to use a certificate authority, a, a trusted third party, rather than a self-signed certificate. Sometimes you'll look at a URL, you'll do a copy-paste of a URL into Notepad or something, and you'll see this big, long string, and you'll think, what is all this gibberish? It's a session ID. Let's not use session IDs that show up in the URL. That could be really bad. Let's keep our security patches up to date, and let's just do basic network security like we talked about earlier. I showed you how to set all these up, the port security, the DHCP, um, snooping and uh, the IP ARP inspection. What else can we do? Well, as already mentioned, let's use secure protocols like HTTP instead of HTTPS. Let's use uh, secure FTP or FTP secure. Oh, and uh, let's use, um, let's do that instead of FTP. Let's use SSH instead of Telnet. Uh, let's use IPsec instead of GRE as a couple of examples. And we might want to use an IPsec VPN tunnel. So if I'm going across an untrusted network like the internet, if anybody on the big untrusted internet captures my packets, they're not going to be able to do anything with them because it's all scrambled up thanks to IPsec. And we'll be talking about IPsec and VPNs at the very end of today's session, by the way. But that's a look at session hijacking. And now we're going to get into module six. And we hinted at this earlier. We're talking about physically securing our network gear so that somebody doesn't walk off with it or alter it or somehow compromise it or break into it. And one of the things we're concerned with is detecting an intruder, like the old video game, intruder alert, intruder alert. And one thing we can do, pretty basic these days, we even have it in our homes a lot of times, uh, we can have motion, detecture, motion detection system sensors uh, to uh, to detect any motion. We can have our passive RFID tags 
put on as inventory tags on our equipment, and we can have portals around doorways. So if somebody carries a piece of equipment with one of these inventory tags on it, it sets off an alert or gives a notification. We can have video surveillance. In, uh, in the old movies where people are breaking into a casino or something, uh, or a bank, they might have a video that they loop and they, they play on replay. Not as easy to do that with IP cameras. So if we have IP-based video surveillance, that's going to go a long way towards physically securing our, our equipment. We can also have something that's going to give evidence of any tampering. You can get these, uh, these sort of metallic stickers or even wire ties that that you can close a computer chassis together with, maybe in a server farm or data center, and if somebody were to open it up to try to insert something in it or take out a drive or something, it's going to be evident. Or it's going to there's going to be evidence that they tampered with it, because that seal is going to be uh, broken or it'll look stretched or it'll give some evidence of it, or that maybe that wire tie is broken, as an example, to prevent people from accessing these areas. I think it's a great idea to have people badge in to areas. Uh, maybe use something like a, a fingerprint scanner, a retinal scanner, and make sure your users are trained on what to watch out for. If maybe in front of a data center, you don't want somebody to wander through and get into a data center by piggybacking on somebody else. Remember before we said, I'm carrying this box. Can you hold the door for me while I go through the door? And uh, somebody might let you in a door. Well, there's something called an access control vestibule or a man trap sometimes it's called. This is a room that has two doors and it's set up such that for one door to, uh, if one door is open, the other door has to be closed. So there's no way for somebody just to sort of watch you go through uh, into the data center and they just kind of follow right behind you. Because before you open that door going into the data center, in the, you're in this vestibule, the attacker, if, if you're going into the data center, the door that the attacker would go through to get into the vestibule is closed. The only way for them to do it is to be in the vestibule with you at the same time. And they're going to, and you're going to like, who are you? So that's, uh, and sometimes there's a security guard in there and you have to show credentials to them before you can just wander in to a data center. And at the very least, let's lock our stuff up. Uh, I'm, personal confession time. I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of, of physical security after an incident that I went through. When I was working at a university, we used to, back in those days, we had a lot of ATM equipment, asynchronous transfer mode equipment, along with Ethernet. And we had a, a bunch of extra gear, like maybe like $100,000 worth of extra ATM gear uh, in a server farm. Now, to get to the server farm, you had to walk through this, uh, this computer training room that we had set up. And to get into that computer training room, you had to go down a hallway and through a door, and there was another door to get into that hallway. So you had to go through one hallway to get into the door, another uh, another door, or have to go through one door to get to the hallway, then you go through a door to get to the training room, then you have to get through another door to get to the server farm. So I thought, nobody's going to wander all the way back there. Our stuff is secure in the server farm, no need to lock it up, because who's going to go through three doors and wander around to get that? Somebody did, because... My, I mean, my fault. I'll take responsibility because I was a network manager. I will, I did not have all the doors secured, and um, somebody walked out with a lot of ATM equipment. So yikes! That one, that one stung. I don't want you to be in that position. And when it's time to get rid of equipment, you don't want to just say, "All right, I did a format on my C drive. It's good to go," and you give it somewhere. No, just because you like do a format on your C drive, that does not mean you've erased all the data. You've erased the uh, you've erased the index basically of the files on that hard drive, so you want to wipe out any configuration that you have. If you have a device where you can do a, a factory default reset, you should do that. Uh, you should sanitize the device. Now, if I'm getting rid of a computer and nobody else is going to use it, I'm just disposing of it. I've done this so many times. I'll find a nice concrete floor. And I'll find a big hammer and I'll put the hard drive on the floor and I will just, I'll just beat it until it rattles. <laughs> and um, that's one way of making sure nobody's ever going to read that data. But let's say you are wanting to transfer a system to somebody else and you do want them to be able to use that hard drive. You don't want to take a hammer to it. What can you do? Uh, again, just formatting it, that's not, that's not, doesn't do it. I like to use something called... Uh, uh, DBN. It's called uh, Derek's uh, Boot and Nuke. And uh, you can boot up on this uh, 
this USB key or a DVD or CD, you can boot up on this and it's going to not just erase your hard drive, you can do several, several passes over that hard drive where it's just gonna write some like random ones and zeros to it. So it's not just like formatting where we're erasing the index of what's on there. No, it actually overwrites everything on there and it can overwrite it multiple times. And uh, yeah, that's if I'm reusing a system and I'm going to transfer it to somebody else, I'll frequently use uh, DBN, Derek's uh, Boot and Nuke. So that's a look at physical security. Next up is the Internet of Things and cloud security. Things that we didn't really, th I didn't think about these uh, 10 years ago as much, but we have to today. You see, IoT, Internet of Things devices, think about the ones that you have in your home. You might want to chat it in. What sort of IoT devices do you have? I'll, I'll give you a sampling in my home. We've got doorbells, we've got uh, video cameras, uh, I've got a TV, my refrigerator can tell me if uh, it, I, t I finally turned it off, it was annoying. Uh, if somebody leaves the refrigerator or door open too long, it would pop up a message on my t television. Uh, the range, uh, just all kinds of things. Uh, I've got a, a Dyson fan, it just goes on and on, uh, light bulbs that we have uh, that are Internet of Things devices. It's super convenient. I love that we can set schedules on how the lights come on and I can see the, I can see all around the house if I'm away from the, the house. But you know what? All those devices, do you know a lot about them? Have you ever done a firmware update on your IoT light bulb, for example? Maybe not. There can be a lot of security holes when we introduce we're poking holes when we introduce these IoT devices because a lot of these devices, their security was not foremost on the designer's mind when they made those devices. And we talked about processing power and uh, versus encryption uh, strength. Yeah, a lot of those devices, if they are encrypting at all, they use a weak encryption algorithm just so they don't, we don't have to put a more powerful processor in that device and drive the cost up. And a lot of those devices have default passwords like your, your video cameras or your uh, even your wireless routers. And sometimes people don't do software updates. They might not be automatically deployed. And do you really think to go update your light bulbs very often? I don't think of that. One of the most famous examples of somebody taking advantage of an IoT uh, security vulnerability was a distributed denial of service attack. This happened back in October of 2016. And... Remember where we talked about how an attacker could, uh, using malware, infect a bunch of computers and they became bots or zombies? Well, in this case, the attacker sort of scoured the internet looking for uh, video, uh, IP-based video cameras, like home surveillance cameras, and wireless routers that were set to their default credentials. So many people just unbox them, plug them in, they left them at their default credentials. So the attacker just trying all these video cameras and all these wireless routers and attempting to log in with default credentials was able to log into a lot of them. So at their, at their beck and call, this attacker had all these cameras and all these uh, wireless routers around the world and the attacker had them simultaneously attack this uh, DNS server, which one, one of the DNS... Uh, one of the sites that that DNS server was servicing was Twitter. It actually brought Twitter down for a large portion of the world in October of 20, uh, 2016 because somebody just logged into all these IoT devices using default credentials. So what should we do? Definitely don't leave things at their default passwords and when you change the password, make it a strong password. And something that I recommend is putting your IoT devices in their own VLAN. So here, here's the thing, even if I have a firewall set up, and the firewall is not going to allow anyone on the internet to come into my network if the session initiates out on the internet. I've got all these IoT devices. I don't know about these manufacturers. I didn't buy my light bulb from Cisco. I bought it from some other, some vendor I've never heard of. Who knows? Could that vendor create malware inside of that bulb or could somebody maliciously have have pre-injected malware inside that light bulb that's now hanging outside my garage? If they did, it's on the inside of my network. And it could go out to the internet and start reporting information and start trying to scour the rest of my network. It's on the inside, so it does have permission to have bi-directional communication with the internet. My light bulb could. 
I don't want my light bulb scanning around and trying to, to get into my Linux file systems. So what do we do? We put them on their own VLAN. It's almost like having a guest wireless LAN just for IoT devices. This is something I'll frequently do when I'm setting up Wi-Fi. Let's put them on their own Wi-Fi network. Uh, don't ju not just a different name, actually a different subnet. So you can have you can have this demarcation point between your IoT devices and the rest of your network devices. Cloud security, that's a big concern these days that I didn't used to think about because I, the, the networks that I grew up in had server farms or data centers. Data was stored locally. But over the past, really the past decade or so, there's the, been this mass exodus of data going from our on-site data centers out to the cloud. After all, we move our data to servers in the cloud. Those can be uh, virtual machines. We can spin up servers as we need them. We don't have to buy the hardware. We don't have to maintain the hardware. We don't have to provide redundant power to the hardware. We just pay for the, the power or the processing power and the storage resources that we need at any given moment. It's, it's great, except we've got all of our data flowing back and forth between our site and the cloud, and we want to make sure that that data is secure. If I'm going over the internet, maybe using a web browser, we want to do that securely. And one way to do that with uh, one security feature that we can have in our web browser is TLS, transport layer security. That's going to encrypt the data being sent between our browser and whoever our cloud provider is. Maybe, and we'll be talking about VPNs here in just a moment, maybe we want to set up a virtual private network between our site and our cloud provider. So as we go through the internet, if anybody were to intercept our traffic, they wouldn't be able to make any sense of it because it's all scrambled up inside of that VPN. Maybe we've got a private WAN cloud uh, where we're using something like Metro Ethernet or maybe MPLS, but we've got this private connection that does not use the internet. And maybe we've got some dedicated servers in the cloud where we're not sharing resources on a physical, we don't have a VM on the same physical server that somebody else has their VM on. I mean, theoretically, they're gonna be isolated, but we might wanna have some, just for extra security, some dedicated servers, physical servers that nobody else is using. Something else we can do is use a feature or a, uh, this function we can get from different providers called CASB. CASB stands for Cloud Access Security Broker. It's sort of gonna be the agent that stands in the middle between the users at the corporate site and the resources in the cloud, and it can monitor traffic going back and forth between the enterprise and the cloud provider to make sure everything looks good. Nobody's doing anything uh, fishy. And if there is malicious activity, it can report that to us. So that's a look at better securing the internet and our, our the internet of things devices we have and our cloud. And in our final module, that's right, we finally reached the final module. Let's see, I was estimating we'd go about five hours today. I'm just doing a projection here. Well, we're gonna be maybe just a hair over four hours, it looks like. Between four and five hours looks like where we're gonna land today. But let's take a look in our final module at VPNs, virtual private networks. First, let's distinguish between remote access and site-to-site -site VPNs. A remote access VPN is where we've got, let's see, here's my laptop. I've got my laptop. This is one of the, the new uh, MacBook Airs and this color, they say it has bad fingerprint problems. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, they're not kidding. It sure does. But I, I love my laptop. And if I'm on the road and I want to communicate securely back with another system, I've got VPN software on here. I can set up a, a VPN. Uh, the, um, the appliance in my home has a VPN server built into it. So I can set up a uh, secure connection between whatever hotel room I'm in and uh, the security appliance in my home. And uh, yeah, it's all encrypted through the internet. But I've got to have software on my laptop to do that. Uh, but if I do, I mean, it's a great solution. I'm not bound by physical location and I can be encrypted. I can have encrypted traffic sent over the internet. And uh, it doesn't even have to be necessarily software that I install. I could use uh, clientless uh, SSL, where you go to a portal and uh, you get through a web interface, you get secure access to selected resources at a site. But normally we're installing a software VPN on a system. And that's, that's a little extra work. So what we might do, if we just wanna connect two offices together, We've got a branch office and the main office, the headquarters. What we could do is have the routers at those sites act as the endpoints in this VPN tunnel. So all the devices at the different sites, 
this is transparent to them. They don't have to install uh, they don't have to install VPN software. They just talk normally to their router. They want to go back to the headquarters, no problem. The router is going to get them there, but there's configuration in the routers that are going that's going to encrypt the data going back and forth between those sites. That is a site to site VPN. And I remember used to uh, back in the 90s when I would work with a client that wanted to connect sites together you're probably looking at something like getting a VPN, uh, not a VPN, but a, a frame relay connection. Uh, I've worked on more of those than I, uh, than I care to think about. A frame relay connection or maybe an ATM connection if you're really bougie back in the day, or, or maybe a, a direct uh, T1 link between a couple of sites. All those options were really expensive. Now we've got fairly low cost access to the internet. I mean, I think I pay $100 a month in my home for at t Fiber, and it's a gig. It's a gig up and down. That's unheard of back when I was hooking up these uh, these businesses back in the day. Yeah, yeah, it's really inexpensive and really fast for a lot of locations to get to the internet. Let's use that, but let's do it securely with a VPN. And that's what we can do with a site-to-site VPN. And again, this is going to be transparent to our end devices. Now, what I want to do now, and you might want to take some no- you do want to take some notes on this, I'll just tell you. I want to talk about two different VPN protocols. GRE, Generic Routing Encapsulation, and IPsec, short for IP Security. First, let's consider the protocol of GRE, a GRE tunnel. A GRE tunnel is super flexible in that just about any kind of uh, any kind of packet we can put uh, send out of a router interface, we can put that in a GRE tunnel. There's going to be a GRE packet that wraps it up. I don't care if it's unicast, broadcast. Multicast. I don't care if it's the I don't care if it's the old Novell uh, IPX or, or, or Apple Talk. It doesn't matter. If you can send it out of a router interface, you're going to be able to encapsulate that inside of a GRE packet. It is super flexible. Awesome. Bad news. It's not secure at all. There there is no encryption with GRE. It's not at all secure. So oh, that kind of kills our whole whole idea of being secure across the internet, doesn't it? Oh, here's another one. Here's a protocol that is very secure. It's in the name. It's IP security or IPsec. This is a super secure protocol. It's going to give us confidentiality in the form of encryption like AES it can use. It'll give us hashing, maybe SHA. Uh, It can do authentication with pre-shared keys or digital signatures. And if somebody tries to to capture packets as part of a valid login uh, sequence and play those back later to get logged in, it's not going to work. Because IPsec is sort of giving almost like sequential numbers to packets as they're sent across. So if I come back later and try to play back valid packets earlier, the sequence numbers are going to be all out of whack and it's not going to be believed. So it's very secure. Awesome. Bad news. And the bad news is it's not flexible. Whereas GRE could do unicast, broadcast, multicast, whatever we wanted, IPsec is limited to unicast IP packets only. Is that a problem? You bet it's a problem because most of our routing protocols are going to use multicast. If I'm trying to do OSPF, then I want to be sending traffic to the multicast addresses of 224.0.0.5 and 224.0.0.6 with uh, with RIP version 2, 224.0.0.9, EIGRP 224.0.0.10. I just kill all that if I try to send it over an IPsec tunnel. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to that problem, but there's so many cool things about IPsec. Let me give you some more features and then I'll tell you how we can address that limitation. First, I want you to understand that there are two different modes of communication. There's transport mode and there's tunnel mode. Now this is a trade-off. You can have a little bit more security, but you get more overhead. Or you can have a little bit less security and less overhead. So it's a balancing act. What's more important to you? Transport mode is going to keep the original packets header intact. So the original source and IP uh, destination IP addresses, they're still going to be there. They're going to be seen. However, with tunnel mode, we're encapsulating the entire packet, including the original source and destination IP addresses. That means that um, if somebody were to capture that packet and they were to look at the source and destination IPs, they wouldn't see the actual IPs of the actual systems involved in the conversation they would see the IP addresses of the um, of the endpoints of the VPN tunnel, like the routers, as an example. Um, yeah, we're adding header information, so there's more overhead, but a little bit better security. We could also use authentication or authentication and encryption. And we've got a couple of options here. We could do something called authentication header. 
It does not do encryption, but it does authenticate the entire IP packet, including the, the outer header. As compared to encapsulating security payload, it does perform encryption, but uh, it's not going to authenticate the header. It's just going to authenticate the packet. So what's more important to you? Typically, I'm going to go with ESP. That's, what I, that's my normal go-to. Now, when we set up an IPsec tunnel, there are two steps involved. There's Ike Phase 1 and Ike Phase 2. Now, Ike, that stands for Internet Key Exchange. And in Ike Phase 1 is a metaphor. D did you ever watch the old TV show? Uh, or now it's um, or a few years ago, it came out as a movie with uh, Steve Carell, uh, Get Smart. Have you seen that one? I was a big fan of Get Smart on TV back in the, back in the, the old days. And I love the movie. If you've not seen Get Smart with Steve Carell, it is hilarious. It is, uh, it is fantastic. And whether you watch the movie or the TV shows, there's usually a scene where Max, uh, Maxwell Smart, he wants to talk to the chief uh, and, uh, of control. And uh, he wants to talk to the chief using something uh, called the, uh, the cone of silence. And then the old TV show was like this big plastic thing that came over them, uh, over their heads. Uh, and it's like this sort of virtual bubble in the movie. But in the cone of silence, the idea is the two parties are going to be able to talk to one another and nobody else is going to be able to listen in. They're not going to be able to eavesdrop in on that conversation because they're under the cone of silence. Now, in the movies and the TV show, for you know, for the comedy aspect, it, it never works right. But that's kind of what's going on here with IPsec. Ike phase one, also known as the Isakemp phase, is we're metaphorically lowering the cone of silence over these two endpoints. And that's going to give them a private communication channel. Now, what's going to be communicated over that private communication channel? Is it the data that we want to send? Not yet. We're going to use the security of that cone of silence, the Ike phase one tunnel, to negotiate the parameters of the Ike phase two tunnel, which is the actual IPsec tunnel. So we can say, all right, I support, I support this set of features, this transform set. And I support this, this encapsulation, or I support this encryption protocol. I support this authentication protocol, or all the things you support. Diffie-Hellman group one, two, whatever. All the parameters are going to be negotiated within the protection of Ike phase one tunnels. And then, once the two parties agree on what they're going to be using for encryption and for integrity, they're going to set up the Ike phase two tunnel. That's the IPsec tunnel where the actual data is going to be sent. But getting back to the big paradox we have, on the one hand, we've got GRE, super flexible, not secure. On the other hand, we've got IPsec, super secure, not flexible. It only supports unicast IP traffic. So what do we do? What if we do both? What if we do GRE and IPsec? Here's what I mean. We can take our original packet. I don't care if it's multicast, unicast, broadcast, whatever. We're going to take that original packet and encapsulate it inside of a GRE packet. What is a GRE packet? It's a unicast IP packet. Do you see where I'm going with this? I'm going to take that unicast IP packet and then protect it with the security of an IPsec tunnel. So we take whatever, wrap it up in a unicast IP packet, a GRE packet which can then be put inside of the IPsec tunnel. So we're going to use both. We're going to use the best of both worlds here. And that's called GRE over IPsec. And I, I was originally planning to demonstrate creating a GRE over IPsec tunnel with you today. And then I realized that our session is going to be getting close to five hours. And if I added a couple of extra demos, we're looking at another hour. And then I remembered, you know what? I've got a, I've got a YouTube video where I'm setting this up. So I created a little link for you that'll take you to a page with a couple of demos that I just didn't want to spend class time on today. But if you go to kwtrain.com slash VPN hyphen demos, the first video on that page is going to be GRE over IPsec. And I show you step by step how to set up what we just talked about in theory and we test it out. Uh, the other video is going to be on the last topic we have coming up in just a moment, and that's dynamic multipoint VPNs. I, um, I set that up. And from scratch and talk, talk about how we verify that uh, type of VPN connection that's dynamically brought up. In fact, let's talk about that. Our final topic of the day is dynamic multipoint VPNs or DM VPNs. The idea is this. If I have a point to multipoint topology like this, maybe I have all these direct connections. Maybe they're um, 
I don't know if they're Metro Ethernet connections, maybe MPLS connections, but virtually I've got a connection from the headquarters to branch A, I've got a connection from the headquarters to branch B, and a connection from the headquarters to branch C. Well, from time to time, even though most of the communication goes between the branch office and the headquarters, there might be times when I want to go from branch C directly to branch B. And right now it's going to be hairpin. It's going to go back to the headquarters and then it's got to go to branch B. It'd be great if I could do that over the internet directly with branch B, wouldn't it? But I don't want to pay to have a, to have a permanent virtual circuit set up all the time between our two sites. But when I need it, I'd sure like to bring up a dynamic multipoint VPN over the internet. Let's dynamically bring it up when we need it. And when we don't need it, let's tear it back down. That's what DM VPNs let us do. They allow us to, on the fly, dynamically bring up a tunnel between these two sites. And it's going to use something called multipoint GRE. Again, that video, and I'll give you that link again here in a moment, but that video walks you through how we set up a multipoint GRE um, interface. And the idea is this. We're going to use the next top resolution protocol to figure out the publicly available IP address with which we should set up this dynamic tunnel. You see, the issue we're facing is something like this. I've got within branch A, I've got a private network. Maybe it's the 10 dot address space. In branch B, I've got maybe it's the 172.16 address space. In branch C, maybe I've got the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 address space. I've got private IP addresses within my sites. And if I'm advertising, maybe like OSPF or EIGRP, I'm advertising out to the hub, here are the networks I have. And then the hub relays that to the other remote sites and say, here are the networks that branch C has. Branch, branch B might say, wow, I'd really like to talk to that network over at branch C, but it's a private IP address. And I have to get to it over the public internet. How's that going to work? I, I cannot route to the 192.168.1.0 slash 24 network over the internet. It's, it's private. It's RFC 1918 private IP addressing. That's not going to work. It cannot be routed over the public internet. So what we do is use the next top resolution protocol. And here I'm actually used a different set of, I, of uh, private IP addresses in this example. But what we're going to do is we're going to tell this database back at the headquarters Hey, uh, if anybody wants to set up a tunnel with me, here's my publicly routable IP address on the outside of my router that goes out to the internet. Here's my publicly routable IP address. If they would like to set up a tunnel with that IP address, yeah, I'm game. Let's, let's dynamically set up a tunnel and then they can get to the private IP addresses within my network. So here's the database on that hub router. We see the, uh, we see the IP address that's going to be on the other end of the tunnel, the private IP address, and we see the physically publicly routable IP address that we'll use to set up that tunnel. Let's, let's go through an example. Let's say that, uh, that R4 at Brent C, it wants to talk to this network of 10, or it wants to talk to the IP address of 10.0.0.2, which I believe was uh, the branch B router. It wants to set up a tunnel with that. However, it doesn't know the publicly routable IP address to use. So it sends up a next top resolution protocol in HRP query saying, hey, what's the public IP address I can use to get to 10.0.0.2? And the hub says, oh, you want to go talk over to uh, 203.0.113.1, R3. That is a publicly routable IP address. So dynamically, R4 is going to set up this link with R3. It's going to dynamically form that tunnel, which is then going to allow users at branch C to get to the private IP address space inside of branch B over that dynamic tunnel. Again, if you want to see step-by-step -step how all that is set up, just go to kwtrain.com slash VPN hyphen demos. And I've got those two VPN demos on there for you. The first one, GRE over IPsec, and there's one on setting up dynamic multipoint VPNs. It would have added probably more than an hour to have done all that live for you today. So we're already getting long. So we will go ahead and uh, let you watch those as homework. All right, folks, that is going to, uh, that is going to wrap things up for our, our webcast. And for those of you watching us on the YouTube replay, I want to give you a big thank you for your huge time investment. I certainly hope it's been well worth it. We'll talk to you next time.